for this scene. You doing, Mark? Good. Thanks How are for, you doing? I'm doing well. I'm very excited to talk to you. Once, when you came in with your band uh, to do a live session, and I found out what you what you do for work, I was like, oh, I need to talk to him. <laughs> if you, uh, if you would like to come on the show, I'd love to talk to him. So thank you for coming here for sure. and, and give me some of your time. Um, to add some background and validity to our conversation, could you tell the listeners who you are, where you're from, and what you do, and maybe some of your education background? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm from Barcelona. I was born in a town really close to Barcelona. Um, I've been already three years here in Chicago now, uh, living here. And I'm, I study engineering uh, about sound and image, but then I decided to change it in my path, and then I did the master in neuroscience, and finally I did a PhD in cognitive science in Barcelona at Pompeu Fabra, and now I'm doing the postdoc at the University of Chicago. So my field of work is uh, cognitive science, neuroscience. I particularly study babies and how babies uh, navigate the social world and understand the social world. And I also play the guitar, and that's how I met you yeah. <laughs> uh, with the band I have here now, uh, which is something I also did a lot in my life. So in Barcelona, I played a lot with uh, a couple of bands. Okay. Um, so that's my other half uh, mm. of, of my life is about music. How long have you been playing guitar or music? I think I started when I was about 13, something like this. Okay. Um, there was my aunt that gave me a guitar as a gift. Uh, it was the guitar of her son, and he was not playing. So she was like, okay, I'm just going to give that as a gift. Mm -hmm. um, and then I I actually just say like, okay, that's a great opportunity to start playing the guitar. Mm -hmm. And before that, I play a little piano, but not much. Okay. And so, you're yeah. how old are you right now? I'm uh, now, I'm 31. 31. I, I don't know why I had to think about yeah. it. But <laughs> <laughs> it's about 18 years you've been playing. Okay. Yeah, yeah, quite a lot. So, but okay. it was more at the beginning. I think, like, I did classes until I was something like 18 or 19 mm -hmm. or even 20. Uh, so that was more intense. I even at some point learned to play a little bit of jazz. Oh, nice. Uh, which I was really proud of. Um, all these went away. <laughs> now I can just play <laughs> rock, indie like rock. blues, yeah. indie rock. That's it. Well, you you guys are great. Want to tell the listeners about your band real quick, just so they know Yeah, where so I play in a band called Tilt Trap right now. Uh, we've been playing together for about like eight months, something like this. Mm -hmm. We have uh, we released an EP like about a month ago. Um which is four songs. We play indie rock. Then we're two singers. I'm one of them, uh, which is a nice thing because we both sing really differently. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a typical band of like two guitar players, one bass, one drum. Yeah. Um, really guitar. tight band. Thank I, you. I was almost like, I wish we recorded more songs. Yeah, we it did a couple of shows only so far, but, you know, we're excited. In June, we have two, two more shows. Oh, nice. Where at? Gonna do you be, know? Uh, one is going to be at Gallery Cabaret at June 3rd. Three, uh, third of June, uh, with Richard Brandini and other people. And oh then, yeah, I know him. Oh nice. Yeah, uh, yeah he came here. He's I been think. here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we're gonna do another show June twenty five at um, uh, how it's called um, Subterranean. Oh Subterranean. Yeah, nice. Downstairs a, or upstairs? Do you know? I have no idea, but it, probably it's a big one because we're playing with a band from New York. Oh nice. It's called Social Creatures. Okay, I they're pretty. Feel like cool. I know them too. My, you might, to go you to might know shows. all the bands. Uh, I, I know a in couple the US. bands. <laughs> <laughs> I know a little bit of bands. Um, um, yeah, it's kind of remarkable the amount of bands I've been fortunate enough to come into contact with, work with, and sometimes not even work with, just be adjacent to or see them at shows, you know. But it's the world's small. You start to realize a lot of bands, but man, there's so yeah. many that intersect and play together and know each other. Yeah. And I'm and discovering that in Chicago, actually, the scene is not that big. No. So so actually you get to know, I mean, we are just starting, but, yeah. but you already see, you know, some bands that we follow that suddenly follow us back yeah. on Instagram. Yeah. And, and you start seeing that there might be some connections with some people already. Mm -hmm. And so that I that's something that's nice because in Catalonia it's exactly like this. <laughs> um, oh, yeah? It's really small circuit and then you end up knowing everyone. Well, the, the thing about it is it's small in a big way whereas because i think it has to do with the musical history and the geography of chicago where it is technically like there's tens of thousands of people in the scene but our scene 
uh, integrates well and actually has crossovers with genres and shows. Right. Whereas a lot of other scenes don't do that based on the geography. It's harder to do that. So a lot of bands from different parts of Chicago with different backgrounds and different financial backgrounds will still be in the same bill on the same show or, or be really close to each other. Right. Um, so it's kind of more supportive with that. And then I've also noticed since it's not as, and this is no knock against LA New York. I love LA New York. I love bands from there. But it's not as cutthroat and strict as right. those cities. So because of that, everyone's more chill and they're more willing to go to each other's shows, pl- cross genre on the bill of the show. The lineup doesn't have to just be four punk rock bands. Yeah. Um, so because of that, like Chicago is big, but because of that, it feels small. Like people you would not expect are part of your scene and will go to your events and you can play with them. And again, they'll follow you, follow them. I don't know. It's just kind of a more like married uh, city when it comes to the arts and yeah. I've noticed yeah and I can imagine it depends also on the when I say a scene I, in my case I, I mean indie rock scene yeah. but I mean I guess some other scenes might be bigger also in the sense of I mean yeah. for example I, I don't have much connection with the hip hop scene which yeah. I would love to but you know it's not exactly the, <laughs> <laughs> I won't end up playing with other people that much um, yeah. But, yeah but yeah I mean so there are a lot of scenes still but it's layered, it's but again, it's uh, obtainable and approachable. Whereas other cities, not as much. And it could, right. it really could just be geography. Like, if you live in uptown Manhattan in New York, and then someone lives in, you know, maybe um, Greenpoint or Will- Williamsburg, Brooklyn, it's not so easy to get to them to play a show like in their area. It's really not. Right. But in Chicago, if someone's on the north side playing at the Golden Dagger and they live in Lincoln Park and you live in Hyde Park, right. it's at worst case scenario, it's still only like 30 minutes. Yeah. You know, it's not far at all. And best case scenario, it's like a 15 minute drive up Lakeshore Drive. Right. It's really not bad. So our city's laid out in a more healthy way as far as like, I, I think the early civil engineers of Chicago, they, right. did, it, they did it right when it comes to the right. layout. But do you think that the artists that start being like a little more known for the people, for the public, and then they want to leave from music, they stay in Chicago? Or sometimes they are like, okay, maybe, you know, mm-hmm. the music industry is in New York or in L.A. And then yeah. if I go there, maybe I have more opportunities, more contacts. I've seen both. I, I know yeah. people that have done quite well for themselves where all they have to do is play music professionally. And some stay in Chicago, some go to New York, some go to L.A., some go to Atlanta, some go to Nashville. Um, Those are kind of the main music hubs of America. There's a couple other, but those are the top. And it all depends on what they're doing. If you're trying to go for, like, a pop star, Mm. you should go to L.A. Right. Like, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. If you're trying to be more of an indie rock, avant-garde musician, Chicago and New York are just fine. So New York has, I think it's twofold, it has the name New York behind it. So people start to look at you differently. Right. Like, wow, they're a musician band in from New, York. New York. Yeah, I mean, the, in this case uh, that I told you about this band, yeah. Social Creatures, is like, oh, they are from New York yeah. and they're asking us to play. Okay, great. Yeah, people automatically so, yeah. think something highly of For you. For sure. Um, and it comes with a lot of background as to why. Like, New York's way more expensive. So if you can live there as an artist, you're clearly doing well. Right. Um, there's more connections to the industry. But then the caveat is it's highly concentrated and saturated and the population is immense and everyone's trying to do that in those scenes. Right. Scenes are still great. I know plenty of bands in New York. I have great friends there. I've played with bands there. I love it. It's like, to me, it feels like a home away from home. I would love to be there more. Mm-hmm. But something special about Chicago and the connection it has. And it's just so, again, obtainable and easy to integrate different scenes that can layer. They don't feel so separate. It's like... There are lily pads in a pond that could easily just touch and just lay on top of each other, right. even though they're different scenes, you know. Um, yeah, it's interesting that, so you said for your bachelor's you were studying uh, audio and images or sound and images? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, at some point I, you know, I was interested in sound, particularly in music. I was playing like a couple of bands and I was like, oh, that sounds as something that maybe at some point can integrate somehow. Um, so I said this engineering, it was the first year and then it had really cool things about it. Uh, but the problem was that it was, um, a lot of programming. <laughs> so most of the time I will see myself like in the, in a computer 
just writing code because the mm -hmm. things we'll do, for example, we'll develop, uh, I don't know, like some software that does some filtering and things when you're like recording and then you want to filter the signal and you want to put some effects, this kind of stuff. We will program that. That's like kind of what we're studying. Um, and then similar with, with image. So we'll do like algorithms that can detect a face, for example, for the cameras or this kind of stuff, which is really cool. But again, it involves all the time being in front of a computer programming. So I like the applications this will have. Uh, I don't like that much the day-to-day. -day. Mm -hmm. And I kind of realized that at some point. And, and even like I was working for six months in a super cool project. And even that, I didn't like it that much. So that's what made me change a little bit. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, this cool project was about something called React Table, which is like uh, there's a table that has a camera behind, and then the table is kind of a mirror, and then you have some objects, and the objects have some code behind, and then the camera can read the code of the objects, and then it's programmed in a way that you have some objects that are like uh, sound generators, for example, mm -hmm. um, and then it generates some like, for example, like just like do, 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 and then with filters, you start putting filters and putting parameters and things, and then you start like manipulating the sound. And actually, it can be like something you can just write music with that. And and some artists have used that. For example, Bjork in one of her, her oh. tours was using this this thing. So I was working there and I was like, wow, this is great. <laughs> but still, I I'm all day like eight hours just programming this stuff, and I don't know, it's not that fun and I like programming <laughs> but not that much. So it's not the, that, it's not what you want to do. Yeah. Some people would love to just no, do that. No, some people love to do that yeah. for sure. Yeah, yeah. But it's not I didn't see myself doing that that much. Do you still do um, anything like that in your own free time? I'm still eight hours in front of a computer. Yeah. yeah so uh, that's but, an interesting segue to go from you you grew up playing music. Were you into um neurology, psychology, um the brain in, in high school and grade school? Were you into that? So, no. So in school, I loved uh, biology. And it was always my favorite thing to do. And um, I love, for example, genes and all this stuff when I was studying that. And I don't know how, why, ex I still now, why I chose a different kind of path. So rather than using bi uh, choosing biology, I chose like drawing technically, like as, it, as if it was an architect. Um, so I went more into the engineering path, more than not the science, like biology and all this stuff. Um, and I always was thinking about that, like, oh, I, I really like biology. I don't know why I did that. Um, and then in, the, in college, I had one subject only that was more about neuroscience. And it was more computational neuroscience. So basically, we'll try to develop neural, ne neural networks uh, with a computer like that simulate some neural structures in the brain mm -hmm. and then by doing that you can kind of apply some changes you can pretend for example that you put some kind of um, medication or something and then you see how the network changes and all this kind of stuff mm -hmm. um, so we did that and I like it a lot and the professor was really good and it really inspired me uh, so then after that I was like I don't know it will be nice to study neuroscience and go more into this direction Mm. Um, which again, also I didn't follow that exactly, but <laughs> but more or less that that brought me more to the neuroscience and psychology world. Again. And that's when you went for like your masters. <clears throat> yeah, and then I, I studied the math. So so then at that point I was uh, I finished my college and I was like, okay, maybe I want to do something more in that direction. But before doing a master or anything, I want to work somewhere. So I found two jobs I like. One was about more uh, processing language for like a, a phone company. Mm. Um, and then the other one was more about uh, working in a lab that were testing participants. In this case, it was a baby lab. So they were testing babies. And it was about language acquisition and perception. And, and I was like, okay, I, I can work there. I can help them with technical stuff. I can write programs to, to do the studies. But to do that, I needed to do a master. So I yeah. was talking with a person, and she was like, "Oh, why don't you do this master if you like this?" And so that's how I ended up. Uh, and that what's that focus in that masters? And the the focus in the master was neuroscience in general, from the psychology perspective, and the, okay. the also more biology perspective. So some okay. people would be in the lab, you know, having like some cells and just like manipulating the cells and try to also apply some. 
um, medication or some some things and see how it changes. Mm-hmm. Um, some people will be more like in a lab like me and doing behavioral stuff with people and these kind of things. So okay. it had both both things. And this is all in Barcelona, Spain? This is all in Barcelona, yeah. Okay. And then I basically stay in the same lab. So my boss at that point, she really wanted me to do a PhD with her. She was insisting and I was not super sure, but at some point I was like, I mean, why it's not? It's a big thing like, to take on. Yeah. Um, so, so that's a funny thing because I, I see now I have some friends that are applying for the PhD and they always ask, like, how did you do it or whatever? Like, I, <laughs> for me, it was really more like my boss kind of insisting, like, why don't you do that? Yeah. Uh, than not me really applying to a lot of places and, and doing. So you originally um, weren't interested in a PhD? I didn't even know about academia. Like, that's something that they <laughs> didn't even know it exists. <laughs> you know what? I understand <laughs> what you mean. Like, you don't learn about the advanced degrees and what they really mean and what you can do with them and the trajectories for terminal degrees in different fields like you don't really know about it until you just go into it and then you learn it's not something you're taught in school your parents don't talk about unless they're in it you don't learn about it it's not talked about in tv shows or films like it's just this mystery until you do it you don't know anything you know right yeah and i think yeah there's people that have some family or some people around that do academia but i in my case i didn't have anyone that did academia yeah uh, so it's something that never came into conversation, kind of. Mm-hmm. Um, although in my co- in college, um, a lot of the people that were like the professors were in academia, and they were like more into technical stuff, more like in, in programming and informatics and like music technology stuff. Uh, but I don't know. I kind of I didn't explore them that much at that point. Yeah. And then it was more like when I was in this lab with baby like research, I was like, oh, wow, this is uh, something I never knew it existed. And it's yeah. cool. It's fun. So, so why baby, why infant research? Why that age group? Well, because I ended up in this lab. That's a reality. That's how it started. But but then I... So the, the funny part of this is I didn't know much also about babies. And I remember the first time I test a participant, I... The parents came, and uh, it was the first time alone testing a, a baby, and it was a six-month-old. And the mother had to go to the bathroom and told me, hey, can you hold the baby for a second? And I just hold the baby, and I realized it was the first baby I hold in my life. Oh, wow. <laughs> I was like, oh, my God, I don't know what to do with this yeah. baby. Like, it's, wow. Um, so so that was kind of really scary and for two minutes I was just looking at the baby and the baby was looking at me probably being like what, what are you doing like this is not how people treat a baby um, and, and I was like please do not cry please do not do, not do anything um, but I don't know like interacting a lot with babies I got super interested and it's so to me it's so interesting that they just come to the world without knowing much and they slowly but actually really really fast Oh, they it's learn fast. A lot of the stuff. Yeah. Um, and then everyone is kind of interested with baby, like, oh wow, it's like trying to walk or like say it's the first word, like right, mm-hmm. like all these things. But like when you study it and when you like pay more attention and are aware and like interact with a lot of babies, you see like, wow, there's so much variability about how they approach things, but also at the end they arrive to similar places and mm-hmm. and they are so interested about learning. All the time, which so is so unbelievably curious. Yeah, I, I have a twenty-month-old uh, niece that I, I watched once when I just saw her this past weekend visiting family for the holiday. And every every time I see her, the gaps maybe one month, six weeks, eight weeks. Like every time that gap ha- happens at this age, something so different about her. Right. She can say more words. She can interact more. She can, like look you in your eyes and like engage more, but then not fully yet. You know, kind of, but not really. She can walk better. Her balance gets better every time I see her. Once she only can crawl, then now she kind of was falling over, and now she, like, runs around, but it's wobbly. Right. Um, She could say more, like, has a bigger vocabulary, but it's not the best. It's very simple words, you know, usually one-syllable words. But it's just so crazy to see that. And I've been around enough kids. I have a lot of cousins and stuff like that, but when you see – I haven't been this close this often, and it's very remarkable to see – how they grow so unbelievably fast and how smart they get. Like um, she had this small slide she got for Christmas. Wouldn't go up. It was didn't understand how to climb up steps. This was at 16 months old. Right. But after like two or three attempts, she figured out and then was just running up and down. And like 16 months old, climbing, going up, sliding, laughing, just kept doing it. 
like kind of taught herself on her own, but was terrified at first. Right. And it's just so remarkable how quick they can learn. I mean, yeah. obviously, we as adults, we can make sense faster, but with a blank slate, yeah. is it is what would you say it's a blank right, slate? That, what would you th- say is going on when a baby's first born? Well, there's like two theories, two big theories, and maybe a little more, but so one is like they're a blank state, right? Um, and then don't know anything, and then it's all about so at the beginning, there's more about things about perception, so they get input from the visual world and then because they get a lot of input and and we're really good with probability humans in general so they can start making sense of things like all the things go together and then it can start categorizing things and all this stuff so there are some people that say like they don't know any concept and at the beginning it's just like like sensations so it's like visual sensation like a physical touch all the things and then slowly from there they start to build something that because there are some patterns, they can mm-hmm. start understanding some concepts. There's people that, and, and it's one of the theory I really like, and I work a lot on that, which is about more like there are some basic concepts that we are born with or they're kind of innate. And when we say innate, doesn't mean that the baby is born and knows about something, but there's a really big predisposition to end up learning this concept. Mm-hmm. And and that's really interesting because it's about if you think about, okay, you have even now that with AI, right? Like there's a machine, and you want to give some basic concepts that will allow them to go into the world and learn a lot of stuff. Why would you put on that, like, yeah. like a head, right? Yeah. Um, and then and then it's interesting. So so for example, in the theory, what they say that babies have is things like, for example, cause can be one of them. So understanding that one thing might influence another one. It's like something mm. that is, it's, we have to have this concept to understand this association, right? Um, and and so that's one of them. The other one, it's more about um, uh, objects. So understanding that objects, for example, are solid and that one solid object cannot pass through another solid object mm. or that if an object doesn't have support, it's going to fall, these kind of things. Um, another one is about more about number. So kind of there's like one system, for example, that it's called approximation system that basically what happens is that if you have, we seem to be pretty good at uh, uh, seeing ratios of things. So if we put like a lot of things together in one place versus um, something that is like less things in another place. We seem to be pretty good at creating ratios between these two. Mm-hmm. And then if you present s- like similar like several times these things and then you change the ratios you see that babies really really early on they notice this change in ratios so you seem that they are kind of like you know you could see these things in a lot of ways you could be paying attention to each particular object to a lot of things but it seems that they have a predisposition of thinking about these mm-hmm. ratios and kind of approximation of the number of things that are in, in both places yeah would that be um, considered like a chunking like you know, like humans like to chunk in like twos and threes. Right. So, yeah. So that's, so it seems it, people say that something about like until three or four, that's kind of the number we can count really well and yeah. really fast, like automatically. And after that, we go more into this approximation system that like, yeah. oh, if like 10, we cannot see 10 things and say 10. Uh, it's more about we can approximate and be like, yeah. oh, this is around this or, or that. Uh, but it yeah. seems that when you go to three or four, we're really good at saying these are three or four. Right. Um, that's kind of the theory of music, why time signatures are always indivisible oh, to four and I never three. thought of it that way. Yeah, cell phone oh. numbers, cell phone numbers, credit card numbers, things, right. social security number. It's always in twos and threes or variables of, of both. Right. Um, yeah, I read. The, I had a really cool professor yeah, yeah, once. Yeah, I read yeah. this book called yeah. Music Memory, and we right. talked a lot about chunking and, right. and music counting. And I'm like, that kind of makes sense since... Were um, melody driven, you know, mammals, right? With speaking, but they also have pattern in speaking. We have pitch and pattern, right? And we do a lot of things in patterns, and we're kind of rhythmic creatures, like innate, and that kind of translates to why I think we create music naturally as yeah. humans, you know. But um, yeah, yeah, no, it's interesting about the chunking, and then that's one of the predispositions I was kind of referring to. So mm-hmm. maybe the brain is really ready to process three, four things at the same time really fast and counting them and separating them versus when we go above the threshold, it is more like, yeah. it's like we can approximate, but, but we really cannot counter these kind of things. Yeah, that, it's probably why when you're a kid, like uh, 
all adults, when you hear like their ages, they just seem, they're just adults. Like it doesn't really matter your age. I remember being like five and if anybody was just like over like puberty, like over like 16, 17, they were just all like old and adults. And I just, I couldn't make sense of numbers. If someone said they were 60, I couldn't comprehend like what 60 years means. It feels like forever because at five years old, each year is 20% of your life, right? right? So it just feels bizarre. I just remember that. And the older I got, the more those numbers started to make more sense and form into like this new map. And now I feel like, I don't feel like I'm going closer to death, Mm -hmm. but I definitely feel like I'm further away from birth in a weird way now that the years, the ratios of time are getting smaller and smaller. Yeah. Yeah, each year probably it's just less important. Yeah, somehow. exactly. When someone says like, oh, it's a year away, I'm like, that's nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but at like, you know, 12 years old, you're like, a year? I'm going to be 13. Yeah. That's so much. Yeah. Um, so your your PhD, what was the dissertation or the focus for that? The dissertation was more about, so one of my main topics is how babies have some strategies to be selective in the way they attend to things oh. and they understand things. So... Um, you know, like sometimes I like to put like, um, um, metaphor of Google, for example. So when you go to Google, you can learn a lot of things. Like there, we still, as adults, there are a lot of things we don't know. Right. And Mm. we, if we at some point think like we want to learn these things, there are a lot of places we can look at, like a lot of things we could learn and how do we choose what we're interested in learning from where all the things. Um, so what I studied a little bit in my thesis was about how babies do that in the social world. So, when they go around, they literally almost everything they see or they hear or is, is new. <laughs> yeah. And they cannot pay attention to everything at the same time. So they have to kind of um, start understanding like, oh, maybe in this situation it makes more sense to pay attention to this person because it's providing me information that is already filtered and I can, you know, it, I can make more sense of and learn faster. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But in other situations, maybe I want to learn about people and then it makes more sense to put the attention in this different way. Um, this kind of thing. So, so I, I was studying these kind of things, and one of the things I was focusing attention on was the language people speak. Um, so how babies are a bit more biased to pay more attention or like want to interact with or imitate people who speak their native language, mm-hmm. and also how they reason about people being able to understand each other when they speak different languages. So, for example, I have a study that shows that babies do not expect people who speak different languages to be able to communicate and transmit information. Um, and that's in general monolingual babies, but if they see someone, people that speak the same language, then they do expect people to be able to communicate. Okay. Um, so these are kind of some basic things that you know to understand to be able to go into the world. Um, mm-hmm. So if someone, for example, is calling like a table a table, right? You kind of need to know is this label this person is using, are all the people going to use the same thing? Are we all agreeing that this is called table? Um, and then if that's the case, I can use it. But also you have to understand that, well, that's only going to be the case from people who speak that particular language mm-hmm. because otherwise people are going to call it a different way. And it's important to understand this conventional part of language um, to be able to, to to reason and learn from, from people. Mm-hmm. So that was one thing. The other one was about, more about what it's called the principle of rationality. So the idea of if we try to understand people's actions, um, there are some people that argue that to do that, we kind of assume that people are rational in some ways. Um, And that's kind of a basic thing we need to understand their intentions or goals. So for example, if I suddenly stand up and I go to the door and I go directly in a direct path to the door, it kind of makes sense to make the assumption of, oh, my goal is to go to the door and open the door or whatever. But if suddenly you start like, I don't know, jumping around and going around in circles and I arrive to the door, you don't necessarily will make the assumption that I was want to go into the door because yeah. I was just moving around, for example, yeah. right? So maybe the assumption will be like, oh, he's just moving around. That, that's the, his goal or, or whatever. So so I'm also studying this a little with babies and how they kind of use this assumption to make inference about the things people are going to do mm-hmm. and how, based on that, they can predict their actions and their intentions on the things. Okay. And that's what well, you do currently at University of Chicago? Yeah, I kind of, I do a, a similar thing. So what I do now is more about kind of using these basic things. So before I kind of understood more about what are the basic things that allow babies to understand people and go in the social world. 
Now, my main topic, I have several ones, but it's about more when they see a, a person for the first time and the person kind of violates the basic things that they have to understand people, what happens? Um, and the way I'm thinking about it is like, well, babies need to learn first from people because people provide them a lot of information that is really useful. And second, also about people because they will see a lot of people and they have to understand why people do things, what are the groups of people that you know um, they can categorize them with. Um, they have to understand, um, I don't know, remember people's faces and the way they talk and the language they talk, all the things. So what I'm studying is like if baby has some basic ways of understanding people and they see a person for the first time and this person violates what they know about people, how do they use this information to decide how to learn from the person or about the person? Mm. And kind of the theory or argument I'm trying to make is like, well, maybe if someone violates their basic things that they know about people, um, what might happen is that maybe are really particularly interested about, about this person. So they're like, oh, who's this person that does things that are different from the people I know and I have seen before in, in, in my life? Uh, but not necessarily they might learn from the person because mm -hmm. to learn from someone, you kind of have to understand them, trust the information they provide you and all the things. And if suddenly someone comes and does a really weird thing or speaks a foreign language or something, for a baby, it might be like, oh, I don't know if that's the person I want to learn from to mm -hmm. start with, kind of. Interesting. Um, and that that also goes into a little bit of the origins of social biases, so how in infancy maybe they start reasoning about the language people speak in terms of the language group and their background and also their race, their gender, all these things. Um, so several people in my field are trying to understand do babies categorize people based on these cues, race, language, and their gender, and how do they use these cues to attend people or like learn from them, all these kind of things. Because these are might be kind of the precursors or the basis that um, will influence how they develop some stereotypes or prejudice or all the things. What so, are your findings? Do you do you find <clears throat> that they do that? So the findings are always like really specific, but as a general thing that might be a little more interesting is like now, for example, for the work I'm doing, one thing I find is that babies seem to care quite a lot about the language people speak and they tend to learn more from someone who speak their native language or who have their accent or they attend more to them when they provide information, these kind of things. Um, but we do not see similar patterns with race. Um, so it seems, so people argue that babies prefer to learn from people from their own race and they have some kind of social biases. But from my findings, I'm thinking more in the direction of maybe language is something that makes more sense to be like really pay attention to when you're really young because language transmits information. So you want to just learn from people that can transmit information to you. Mm -hmm. But race, really, it's like something that it's a perceptual cue that, yes, you're more exposed to see some kind of faces, and then you can process these faces more efficiently because you've seen them a lot. Um, so there are some things like this. So maybe pay attention differently to people from different races, this kind of stuff. But it all can be explained always with perceptual biases in general. Mm -hmm. So I just put like a little bit of attention to this phase and that I've, I've seen a lot. Then maybe I put more attention mm -hmm. to the other phase, something like this. But we do not see that many patterns of them interacting more negatively with people from other races or not learning from them, these kind of things. We don't see it. So Right, because then that would mean something about interracial couples. You know, then would they act differently with like a mom and dad if if especially if like they're say a, a black and white person and the baby comes up more fair skinned, would they act differently with their, say, if their father's black, you know, versus their mom. Like, and even that gets challenging because right. the, the tone, the timbre of the voice, the, that that's a different thing too, I'm sure, sonically for the baby. Yeah. Yeah, so in general, these studies look more into general biases with new people kind of, but I think everyone will argue that, you know, whoever are your parents, the baby won't, won't, won't care. <laughs> yeah. Like they would always like their parents, love their parents, and even like a teacher, if they have enough exposure with someone and the person shows that, you know, they are like, for example, with in the case of language, if you show them someone who speaks a foreign language and they start to get to see that this pe person provides information, mm. this person is friend with their parents, 
all these things, it might they might start being like, oh, this person has a different convention in the way that they talk, but yeah. but still I can learn from this different convention. That's something interesting, right? So in general, babies will want to learn. That's kind of the general thing. But we're looking here is these really basic general patterns with new people. Like you see a new person, how are you going to learn from them or attend to them, all these mm -hmm. kind of things. Um, so, so yeah, in general, like if the parents are like biracial or like from different like races or whatever, I... For a baby, clearly it doesn't matter. Like yeah, they, yeah. Um, I don't think it matters. Yeah, at all. yeah, yeah. But but the idea from our studies or the things I'm starting to see is that it just race in general doesn't matter that much for babies. Mm -hmm. It just matters in terms of like how well they can process a phase. As adults, it happens for us too, right? Sometimes we see people from different races as more similar yeah. between them than not people from the, our own race, and clearly yeah. they are all similarly different. It's just that we are much more experts in processing some kind of faces uh, than others. Yeah. So, so that happens similarly with babies at some point. They start losing this ability to discriminate everyone really well, and they start putting them more as more similar somehow. Mm. Um, but, but yeah, that would be probably the more interesting conclusion of my <laughs> studies so far. <laughs> <laughs> now, who are these babies? Are they are they coming in for studies? Are they Ba babies who are seek like need help like w how do you get to work with a bunch of babies at a university right so <laughs> these are um babies that um we just generally reach through social media right now um, oh really be before it was different but now it's social media interesting and then um uh, in general because we study um a neurotypical development so we try to tend to see, have babies that are like you know have neurotypical development um if someone is more interested in seeing some like um, um, cognitive delays or these kind of things, then they might get like different populations. Uh, but in our case, it's just social media. We just put an ad and say, hey, we have this study. We're studying this. We pay some money. Interesting. And uh, people participate. So it's not like study clinical trials, like getting people in, maybe pay the parents some money for the baby. Yeah. Yeah, we don't pay a lot because the idea is that it has to be voluntary. Like, you know, like yeah. actually that's interesting. In Barcelona, they don't allow you to pay to the families because... Because you then you're be, kind of exploiting your babies. Yeah, you, you will be paying <laughs> to they? a baby and parents might be uh, using a baby to get money. But here we can pay some money. Not a lot, but we can pay some money. Um, well, if it makes you feel better, when I was a baby in a lot of those studies, it's because I needed to be because of my surgery, and they had to figure out right. if they had to figure out if I was developing okay. Because right. when you mess with the brain, as you know, it's quite dangerous yeah. with development. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. So, so I think you know something. A lot of people ask about you know my work, like why, why do you do that? Why is it interesting? <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of things really doesn't have a clear application, right? And and people that do clinical stuff have a more clear application. Uh, but I think that one interesting part is that we just try to understand how things develop and how things work in the baby's mind and brain and also in terms of like their behavior in the world. Mm -hmm. And also we develop kind of methods and and um, strategies to kind of study what babies are thinking or mm. how they process things because the baby doesn't talk. So that's actually a really big part of the work, just figure out how do we discover a baby expect someone to, for example, transmit information or not. Like, how do we yeah. do Yeah. I mean, it, um, and it varies very quickly because there's a point when a baby, all it can do is cry and then it can make some words and then it is fully speaking. And that varies. Like, some babies can start speaking well at nine right. months old. I didn't start speaking until I was four. Right. Uh, my first word was doctor, so that's right, funny. Right. <laughs> yeah. But, like, you know what I mean? Like, some people, I took way longer. Um do you know do you know why that happens to certain babies why some are quick and some take longer but at the end of the day they right. both can speak fine as adults you know I mean there are a lot of factors um and and a lot of people try to understand like specifically each factor if it has some influence so for example one of the things is just exposure to language like there will be people that will just hear like have some input that is more qualitative uh, qu uh, has more quality, right? Mm -hmm. Like so, it's like parents are talking a lot to the babies, and they are all the time interacting, and they have time. For example, they don't work that much, and then they have time to be with them and talking a lot. So that one might might be one factor. Oh. 
The other one related to that is like, in general, socioeconomic status in the sense that if you have less resources, you might work more hours and uh, have less time with a baby. And also you might live in a house that has more noise around or it's like le- le- less control. So there are kind of these things more related to the socioeconomic, socioeconomic status. And then there are a lot of things related to more clinical um, issues. Uh, so that, for example, in your case, probably it's more like a clinical um, issue. Yeah, um, it, def- it definitely was. Right. And then there's variability, natural variability, which it's fine. Like that's another thing that, you know, like sometimes in our work, we try to also find ways of being like, okay, at this age, generally this, they should be doing this. And if that doesn't happen, that might be an indicator of like, oh, pay more attention to this kid or something. But that that doesn't necessarily mean anything. <laughs> like it, it just like, maybe you have to put more attention, but there's variability and for example some kids start also walking later or not and then we all yeah. walk fine so why should sometimes people some people are like yeah we should try to push the you know babies walk as fast as possible it's like well i mean just it's kind of nice if what you try is that they have cognitive stimulation and they naturally will be learning about these things and yeah. maybe have some like limitations in the way that their brain is like developing or something that will make it more even more challenging but still they they probably a lot of them will arrive to a point that that they learn enough to go into the world and mm-hmm. have a life and and work and all the things so 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 a lot of fun. It's, it's difficult to, to say yeah. but in your case do you do you know why like i mean your case is i have some case. ideas like so i was the youngest child so and my my parents came from a more like working class, less means background. Mm-hmm. So no one really around to take care of you. I remember being quite young and alone. Uh, if mom had to go to the store, stuff that right. people wouldn't do now, right. but whatever. Um, but yeah, I was the youngest, so maybe less attention because my mom had to worry about two other kids and then had to start working again, you know? Um, but I think uh, with my surgery, there was two factors. Something definitely happened with that that I can't make sense of but the other factor is because i had such a traumatic thing my family really babied me because they were just grateful i survived mm-hmm. so they like i was the baby that survived something that i could have died from um and then 10 years prior i probably wouldn't even been able to have the surgery when have died anyway right so be getting babied and like just kind of like overly protected by my parents um allowed for two things to start happening maybe they didn't push as hard in certain things to let me be uh, to figure stuff out but then at a certain age by the time I was like four or five and I think I showed that I was okay in developing they let me do whatever I wanted probably because they just were so happy that I was alive right. so then I got extremely curious and got into some chaos but after going to so many strange testing at different places like Rush Hospital UIC University of Chicago talking to different neurologists and psychologists um at like seven years old, I took an IQ test and the it was at University of Chicago. And the, I believe as a neurologist gave the information to my mom. She brought it to my school because I had like a speech impediment, dyslexia, and I couldn't pronounce things well or mm-hmm. speak well. Still can't, but I've gotten much better. Um, the, the, the principal was like, had a note from an actual doctor from the university and the, unfortunately, I was in a bad school district, and then the principal was like, there's worse kids than him, so we can't get him, like, tutoring and stuff. Like, I needed right. tutoring. I probably would have been much better off if I got it at right. seven years old when you're still developing your speech abilities and, and um, language. There wasn't any, so I just didn't have help, and I just kind of went through the school system. That's right. that's the problem with lower uh, income and less means individuals from different backgrounds and school districts that don't have funding. That's a whole nother problem with our system where, yeah, where some yeah, yeah. certain school districts have a lot of funding for help for their kids and other ones have none. And then the kids just, if you don't fix speech and learning problems by a certain age, it is not impossible to fix it throughout your life, but it is so much harder. You know, like you have an accent because you didn't learn English at three years right. old, right? But if you did, you would speak it like how yeah. in America, in Chicago, right. you'd speak like me, right? So like if you don't learn those things at, a, at, a, at the right age, it is very difficult. So what helped me with to get rid of stutters, speech impediment, uh, dyslexia is just 
reading and writing and like actually physically writing more, typing more, right. and just reading more and more and more. And I used to have to rewrite an email, I don't know, 20 times to send it. Now it's just twice, you know, right. maybe three times if I'm nervous about who I'm sending it to. Right. But it used to take forever because I'd look up and everything switched around and backwards and I'm missing things and that's not the right word and I don't know what that word is and I'm like, right. <laughs> what is going on? It's like a maze. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a quagmire. Yeah. It's it's strange. But yeah, it takes, yeah. I mean, yeah, I think you can get there. It's just that it is, I mean, these things are important particularly for school because a lot of things depend on these, right? Yeah, so I did then, really like, bad in school. <laughs> if you cannot do well on language and learning and and... and it might be difficult to, you know, do well in math and like because it's yeah. all it's involved. In. So that's one thing. But yeah, the other one, what you were saying about writing an email twenty times, I, to me it feels a little bit similar, but it, it, like with of course a lot of difference. But with, for example, in my case, and English is not my native language, particularly at the beginning. Like each email will take me like one hour and a half <laughs> <laughs> to be like, oh my God, did it's you so learn difficult. English in Spain? Yeah, but it's not that good in Spain. So yeah. I already had a pretty good level in the school as compared to some of my uh, classmates. Um, although some went to like extra like English school and then they had mm -hmm. better. But and still, I I came here and I was like, woo! I I cannot follow a single conversation <laughs> in a bar. <laughs> Uh, other places in Europe, they have so much better um, level of English for several reasons, but. Uh, so so yeah, we learn. We start learning when we're three, English, but in a pretty bad way. I think yeah. uh, that we really don't learn that that much. Also, if you don't use it in your day, that's the thing. Yeah. Also, a lot of people ask me that so in, when I was in Barcelona because it was a language lab. A lot of people will ask me like, should I expose my kid to Chinese, for example, because it might be a language that is really important. And generally, our response will be like, if naturally makes sense. Yes, but if not, if you just your kid goes to a class like from one to three of Chinese class and never again is gonna speak Chinese, yeah, it's gonna forget. Like it's not gonna right. be useful almost at all. Um, so, so in general, this so so that's one of the problems of English in the schools that we will learn in the class, but then never again will speak it. Right. Um, and then, for example, TV in Spain they double it to to Spanish or Catalan. So you, we don't have exposure of that. So countries that they have the original version of the movies, for example, they speak quite better, m much better in yeah. English in general. Because that makes sense. Because it's a lot of exposure outside of the class room. Or right. Something. That makes sense. I mean, it's it's similar like in, in America, specifically Chicago. It's a great idea to uh, learn some Spanish. There's a lot of Spanish-speaking right. people in Chicago. And I'm half Mexican, I'm, but my dad never taught me it. And my grandma would here and there, we'd watch movies in Spanish. And um, so I like, I, I know some stuff really well. And when I, I went to Mexico City recently, you know, by the ninth, I went there for nine days, by like the eighth, ninth day, I was like, oh, I could see how people learn a language if they just live somewhere. Right. I started to make sense of everything. I could listen to people and like, understand what they were talking about mm. because I didn't really hear English much for a whole nine days. I just kept right. hearing Spanish, Spanish, Spanish. And even I started saying stuff in Spanish and responding in Spanish and sometimes even thinking a little bit in Spanish. I was like, whoa, this is wild. Right. I wish I learned it when I was younger, but what what do you think it is about the human mind that kind of has like this shutoff valve for being 100% Maybe not 100%, but kind of 100% fluent in language if you don't learn it past a certain age. It's, it seems to be between, like, what, 8 and 10 or 7 and 10? Like, yeah, not 100% of the time, but it seems more likely than not. If right. you don't learn it before, then you won't even – you can't nail all the right intonation and accent right? and all that subtlety. Yeah, I, you know? I think still some people do, and I have some friends that speak really well, and they can adapt to, you know, the, the accent, and people don't even realize. So I think it's still – you, okay. Some people have the ability to do it. I am not that good at languages, <laughs> so I don't have that ability. Um, but it's something also about a lot about, I mean, the it's just like sometimes even so simple as like your perception abilities. So sometimes, for example, in Catalan, we have several vowels, which is like e, e, a, which is like kind of re relatively similar 
Some people in Spain, which we're super close, we're neighbors, they do not hear the difference between e, e. For example, if you, you, you say it really fast in a word, they think it's exactly the same vowel because mm. the mind is, it works a lot with probabilities. So then you see like a vowel that is like in a space that seems similar to like the category you have, which is the E, for example, in Spanish. And then you hear E and you say like, oh, that's that's that, right? Yeah. And I put it in that box because the mind ha needs to process so much information and needs to be really efficient. So it starts doing these kind of things. Um, so sometimes when you learn a, a new language, you just don't even realize you're saying something wrong because you don't even perceive it. Yeah. So it doesn't yeah. exist. And for example, for me, until the moment that people start making fun of me for saying very good, right, and very good, like this V, B. Yeah, yeah. It just didn't exist in my <laughs> mind that there were like a distinction there. I don't know you well enough to make fun of you. <laughs> no. But um, so, yeah, sometimes part of it is that it, it's just so difficult because you don't even perceive some things and... and I don't know, and it takes a lot of practice. And, and I think when you live in a place as a mom and the people, some people will end up speaking super, super well, almost as a native, but some people, I mean, I don't know exactly why. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we might not, you know, arrive to this level. And at some, today, for example, I woke up and I had a seminar, I had to give a talk in my lab. And I don't know why my English was bad today. <laughs> yeah. And I started talking and at some point I was like, I, I don't know what's happening, but I'm <laughs> having issues today. <laughs> did you not sleep uh, well or coffee? No, I, I did, I did. I don't know. Uh, maybe it's the weather, the sun. I was it like, was what so am beautiful. I what am I doing here in the lab? Can you maybe, give the can you give the, the speech outside? Were you I allowed to do that? I have proposed that. The problem <laughs> is the PowerPoint, but uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I don't know. But so so it depends a lot on but the mind is so I don't know. In that sense of language, it's so weird. For example, one thing someone was studying in, uh, that that's something that really fascinates me about studying the mind. You realize how good it is and how incredible it is. And for example, someone who was studying about language in Barcelona kind of was one of the first ones to discover that the mind, when you see something or when you hear a word, you activate the word in your head of all the um, languages you know about this word. So, for example, I see a table, and just by seeing a table, my mind seems to be activating the word table in Catalan, in my case, Catalan, Spanish, and English, for sure, and maybe even some other languages that I know slightly. What is it? Masa? What is table? Mesa. Mesa. In, 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 ah. Yeah, in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> Mesa. Because as soon as you said it, I my mind went to right, like that. Like, yeah, <laughs> and then taula in Catalan. Uh, but that, that's impressive because that means... The mind is like having so much information all the time because if it's activating all the things and the idea of doing that is that there's one that will win. So there's some weights, right? Like, so I, and now I'm speaking English, so I see this and the word table really goes. Now, for example, miss actually was in my mind, but the word table, it's more ready to be set, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's more ready to for the brain to say like, okay, that's the one I need. Uh, but the other ones are there because in case someone comes and speaks in Catalan or whatever, my mind has to be able to understand the word mm -hmm. taula, for example, really fast. So it kind of activates a little bit. The mind does a lot of that with a lot of things. It just have a perfect balance between I have everything kind of ready, but at the same time I have some things a little bit more ready so you can use them easily. Mm -hmm. But also in case you need to change something, I, I have the other ones around so you can take them somehow mm. and, and, and use them. I, um, based on what you're saying, I, I wonder what a, a baby's, like what's the average age you tend to work with? So I work from usually three months to 18, something like this. Okay, so yeah, close months. to where my, na my, my niece is at yeah. right now. Um, so because everything is like novel to them, everything's new, how does their short-term, long-term memory work relative to like yours and mine now? Because... They obviously need to have long-term memory to learn, like, don't fall off this, don't touch that. Um, parents say don't do that so they know not to. But but then they're always taking in new stuff constantly. Everything is truly new to them. Right. Like, to us, things are, like, variations of new. On It's just a tinge based on stuff we already know about. Right. And you know, if I go to a different country and see a mountain, it's like, that's just a mountain in this country. I've seen one in America. But to a baby, every single thing is new. Right. So I, what are like what goes on with the processing of long term and short term memory? Like when does it start to have more detachment? I see. 
Yeah, so that's actually an interesting question because I really don't know that much about memory, but what I think I know about from the field or like at least some intuitions and things I heard is that so there's this idea of like we don't remember anything in our lives before we were three or something like this. Yeah. Um, so that's one thing that people say like, well, so then we don't have long-term memory as a babies. But then there's some people I think that argue that there's some kind of long-term memory. I don't know exactly how it goes away, but at some point it goes away. But it's so I'm not super sure. But there's this general. Th- like believe that we don't have long term because of that because we don't remember anything before that age mm-hmm. and and that's probably not exactly true at least we remember like also humans are really good at rememberabilities for example like when they learn to walk and they can remember that thing really well but it's it's different than episodic memory right like remembering i was here with my mom mm-hmm. and this was happening that's a part that is not super here it's not know. good at all how, how it says, yeah <laughs> But then the other, in terms of short memory, the, again, also, this is like me talking without knowing much about it. But but to me, it feels like generally when, when we, for example, design experiments with babies, um, we tend to not put them a lot of things because we're like, well, we, they cannot process that much. And they can barely remember, you know, if a person appeared and then you put the person after that, but before something happened, it might be that they don't recognize that person. And so they are still like, trying to figure out that they're not as good as adults in remember things and, and keep things in their memory, in their short-term memory, all the things. But also another way of thinking is that like they are actually really good, but as you said, m- things are more new, so it's just much more information they have to keep because as adults, we're really good at categorizing like, oh, this is a person, okay, this is a face, boom, I have it, and this is in my box that I have because I learned for like years and years how to do that, mm-hmm. versus the baby is like, everything is more blurry <laughs> than this is more difficult to remember then. And it's not necessarily that the machine is worse or not that developed. It's more that the information is more difficult to put into boxes and remember. Right. That makes uh, more sense. You can't categorize things when there's no foundation yet. You're right. one years old. So it's almost like maybe it's a waste of like processing power to try to have that when you should be learning how to take everything in and then build that foundation to have long-term memory. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah. It might be that it, it could make sense also to be like you have to focus on kind of make create these foundations yeah. a lot, then yeah, from, yeah. from there you can start to remember things. That better. could be it. Yeah. It, I mean, it is interesting how yeah. it's such a mystery before about three, three right. and a half years old. Yeah. There's also this effect that like, which is called the Goldilocks effect that we see with adults, but also with babies, which is that, for example, when they are like paying attention to things, they tend to put, spend more time and pay more attention and try to encode more the kind of information that is not too difficult, not too easy. So if you put them a lot of information that is really new, that's too much to process. That's not, it's something they might look at it, but it's like, it's so much that it's really difficult to retain it. So maybe it doesn't make that much sense to spend time on that because there are other things in the world you can be paying attention to. Yeah. If you see something super easy that they have, they know a lot and it's super predictable and there's no new information, again, it's like why I would pay attention to that if I need to learn a lot of things in the world. Mm-hmm. But it's this kind of mix, like middle level of one and the other one. So something is new but not too difficult to or too new. Mm-hmm. That is the right level of being like now that makes a lot of sense to spend time here to learn, to be able to learn something. Mm-hmm. So... I don't know that that's something also in my in my field there's yeah that's something I work lead with these kind of right levels of when to put attention to things based on you can learn some some information mm-hmm. it's not too much it's not too little you know it does seem like babies have this really it's cute it's adorable but they have this funny short term <coughs> capacity where it's like you put on a movie it's good for like 10, 15 minutes and they want to do the next thing. They, like, right. They're like they not yeah. sitting through a whole movie. Uh, my brother was just jokes. He's like, yeah, I just watched like 10 minutes a day of this movie. It takes weeks to get through it. Right. <laughs> you know, and then it's like, okay, go play over there for like five, 10 minutes. Okay, the next thing and the next thing. Right. And it's 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 very interesting because you, when you watch it, you can almost see like how this creates a person. They, right. they take little things and they start to piece things together. Um, even things that are different, topic subjects they start to piece it together but back when we were talking about 
like, are we born a blank slate or do we have some innate knowledge um, or at least uh, tendencies to learn something in it? It seems like all infants, if not most, are born with this ability to cry when you went to the bathroom, want to eat, right. and you want to sleep. And then maybe if you're hurt, you mm-hmm. know, like something hurt you. Those or, – or stressed. Those are probably the same place, stressed out or hurt. Um, so the fact that a baby cries for those very specific things and really – Nothing else, maybe something else, but you would know more. Um, Maybe that's proof that babies really are born with something to know how to react. Or or you think it's more of just a complete reaction and it's not too much going on there? Yeah, probably a lot of people would say it's an instinct reaction, which, I mean, you have to process something to be able to respond. So, yeah, they process something. But probably, so for example, in the case of emotions, I mean, crying is. It's it's the way they have like it's like similar with uh, movement for example you know like at the end of the day we have an arm and the arm can move to some particular directions and so it's probably a similar thing like when you feel something whatever you just have a reaction so that people probably will say it's more instincts it's not about mm. abstract knowledge about anything yeah but for example in the case of emotions there's a debate whether some emotions are more innate or not um, and. Some people will argue that there's something like happiness that is universal and you kind of born with the idea of like, you know, at some point you will be predisposed um, to understand that something is happy or like, and then we also see that with a smiling and all the things. So some people study that as something more universal and innate. Mm-hmm. Some people will argue that there's nothing like, this like each culture will have different things and some cultures might not you know although most of the cultures smile and associate that with like being happy and and in a good mood it might not necessarily be like this and it's really contextual dependent and then the only things you have is some super basic instinctive feelings which again goes a lot to the sensations about like i'm comfortable or i'm uncomfortable and i'm more uh ar- I have more arousal or less, right? Like I'm more like lazy and I don't want to do things or I, I need to do something. That's mm-hmm. kind of like the two basic states and from there, how you build the motions, it will depend a lot on the culture you are and the, your yeah. environment and all the things. So so in most of the things, <laughs> people in general that study babies will have this debate about does language innate or not. It's like emotions. Are some emotions more innate and more mm-hmm. there's something even in the brain that express happiness or not at all? And it's just like this super basic, uncomfortable, not comfortable and arousal or not. Yeah, um, I don't I don't know if language I'm not sure how innate it is because have you ever heard of the case of um I forget her last name with this young girl Janie? Or I think Jeannie or Janie, who was um, unfortunately her parents like kept her in a room right. for like thirteen years. Mm-hmm. They they I think they ended up either killing themselves or going to prison. Oh wow! But she never was exposed to anything. Right, and she couldn't speak. Uh, she kind of just made these interesting, almost foreign alien sounds, like squeaking and screaming. Right. So couldn't speak. Uh, never left the house. Never left that room. And I think she became like a ward of the state and was studied a lot, obviously, by doctors. But um, I, remember, I remember learning about it and reading about it in a psychology class in, yeah. in college. But she she couldn't speak and she never really learned how to speak. Right. But when people say innate, they never say that someone being alone completely and isolated from the world will speak. I think no, mm. no one in the language, studying language will think that's the case you always need exposure it's just more that if we have that super like early and tendency to for example group speech into grammatical structures for example like which is chomsky for example like like famous theories are about that like there's some kind of basic innate um predispositions that that are really linguistic uh, that will allow, like, you, as soon as you start having exposure, it will allow you to learn super fast and be super efficient in the way you learn, mm-hmm. which some people have proved wrong. But so in the case, for example, of that, no one will, expo- like, will expect this person to speak. But there are examples. So someone in my department said something super interesting, which she's called Susan, Gold- Susan Golden Meadow, mm-hmm. and she studies gestures a lot. And at some point of her life, I think in the 80s, she studied a lot um, people that were deaf 
um, the kids were deaf and then their parents were not and they didn't know how to speak sign language. So the idea is that these people will be kind of the example of a case in which they're really not exposed to language that much. But the difference of these people is that they will be exposed to communication because with the parents they will try to communicate somehow, but there were no linguistic like uh, yeah. tools that they could use because noth nothing like this will work. And one thing she discovers in her work is that you see that you go to these isolated cases of people and they kind of generate some kind of patterns of communication that they are still not language in the sense that they don't have a structure like language, a grammatical structure with nouns, verbs, all the things and, and that go in a particular order. But there are some things that seem more similar to a sentence and they find ways of repeating a gesture in ways that parents finally will understand it mm. and then they will start be able to have some minimum communication. And then at some point she found that when you put these people together with other people that are that, like doing these gestures, it seems that actually the level of um, complexity start increasing. So that's so of, they're not speaking sign language together. So they're not speaking sign language, none of them, because they're not exposed to that. But they are kind of creating their own just sign language. Gestures. And huh. the, at the beginning, it's really, really basic. Yeah. They can say some words. They can say you know they can express some actions. But the idea is that. This is an example of you put a group of people together not exposed to language, the result probably, or at least what she claims, it yeah. will end up creating language at some point. The thing huh. is that you need a lot of labels, a lot of generations of interacting, right? And that's we don't have that in the real world. Yeah. But so that's kind of the argument about there is clearly predisposition. It's not, you know, like you need exposure to learn, but but even if the exposure you have is not linguistic that much, it just like have some source of communication, but it's not particularly linguistic, you will start trying to go in there Something. to be able to communicate in yeah. a more efficient way, kind of. That is interesting. Yeah. It's, it is also fascinating. I never really thought about it until you just did all these gestures in front of me, how much we communicate with gestures. Right. Not even speaking sign language, just you can tell so much about someone based on these little things we yeah. do. Did when do um like do babies start developing that like when does that start to happen because I, I, when you look at little kids they still do gestures but it's not nearly as complicated so or gestures are, yeah appear pretty late um in infancy so at 12 months something like this more or less it's when you start seeing people like babies pointing and then there's a lot of debate about what this pointing means it might mean i want this or it might mean look at this right like it have have different meanings but, for example, there's a study I really like that is, like, one of the first signs of something that is not a gesture still, but it goes into the direction of a gesture of communicating, which is um, a study that what they do is they have a baby reaching for toys, and the toys are in general, like, to their, they can reach them pretty well. Mm -hmm. And then at some point they put a condition in which the toy is really far away, and then they see what happens. And what happens is that when the baby is alone, they don't even try to reach for the toy because they know it's too far away. They try maybe once and like, okay, I cannot. But when there's a person close to them, particularly if it's their parents, they will start reaching a lot in a way that they they do know based on the condition that there's no person. They do know they cannot get it. But if they are doing that, it's the way they interpret the author's this result is that they are kind of it's a way of communicating to the parent like, hey, I, I really want the thing and that's the way I have to say it or communicate it is by trying to get it mm. and hope that you at some point will just give it to me mm. uh, because now I, I cannot arrive or something like this. So it, it's pretty late. It's after the year more or less, but even before there are some precursors of that and, and by the year they start pointing and, and then it will start like, it will start developing a little bit. Mm. Uh, but, but yeah, it's a complex thing to do and, and understand. Also, it requires a lot of motor skills, which they still developing and they don't yeah. have that much. So, but, yeah. Yeah. But so, yeah, they barely even have balance, you yeah. know, a lot of, like they're just sitting there right. like shaking. Yeah, yeah. But something interesting about this professor, again, she's, her work is great. So <laughs> I always will, uh, I like to talk about her work. So she showed things, for example, like th that gesturing sometimes is a way of thinking and necessarily the actions you do or the things you do 
might not talk about your mind as much as your gestures. So, for example, she has a study with children doing math problems, and then they have to solve an equation and say the result. And then there are like three kinds of kids, the kids that solve it and they have learned it, the kids that they have not learned it at all, and they don't do any sign of things that they have learned it. And there are the kids in the middle, which they do not solve it. They always put it wrong, but they gesture in a particular way that it's consistent with the correct response. So basically they are gesturing. So in these cases, like they have to sum two values. So if they gesture putting the, the fingers in the two values, but they still do it wrong, um, these kids are more likely to learn pretty fast about what they have to do. So that mm. means that their gestures are already indicating, they're telling them in the way like, oh, that's what you have to do, but they still cannot, maybe because they can inhibit the response or they have not completely understand, mm. understood what, what, how it works, uh, but they don't still do it. So sometimes there are the things like by looking at some gestures, you can kind of know what's up in their mind, even though maybe at the end they will give a response that it's like similar to another one, but mm -hmm. the gesture might tell you, oh, maybe they're not the same. Maybe they're a different group of people mm -hmm. because the gestures m might not match, for example, their response. And that means something. That means something about the, the person mind. Wow. It is complicated. <laughs> yeah. And it's so complicated because they can't really communicate fully well. What like an adult, when you, when you psychoanalyze or speak with or study an adult, you can talk with them. Right, but to not be able to do that while they're like had this very malleable, open universe of a brain that's just soaking and everything, it's like, and they're so fast. Like one day the baby's different from the next, just because they keep learning so much, right. and it's like they're they're unbound, so they can't you. They just keep going to the next thing and taking it in. Yeah, that is a very fascinating thing, and I always wondered like, do you ever work with or study babies where? They have both parents, one parent, and no parents, and like some of the different effects on a baby in those types of environments. No, I, no, I, I, in general, in my studies, so there's people that put more attention into, you know, have different situations of exposure to things and in general how development affects. So, for yeah. example, this professor I said, like having these kids are there from the things. In my case, it's more about, in general, like, whoever wants to come into the lab, <laughs> it's accepted and I don't manipulate that much of things. Um, the only thing I'm doing now more, we're putting a lot of effort on that, is that generally in the lab tend to come people that are more from middle, high SES and in generally more white families. Um, so this population is quite overrepresented in, in these studies uh, and this has happened in a lot of fields. Um, yeah. But uh, so now, because particularly we're also studying race, so we're putting a lot of effort and getting, uh, trying to get people from other racial groups also. But apart from that, it's just like whoever wants to participate. Right, so you can't get a good, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm sure there was an effect. How could there not be one, you know, right. growing up alone, like in an orphanage or something, or yeah. even being adopted, you know? I'm I wonder, could a could an infant tell if it's that's the biological parent or not? Right. Especially if it's like a dad, you yeah. know. So, so in in terms of orphanage, we collaborate. And so I have a paper with someone that is in Maryland, and he is someone that one of the first to study infants in orphanage, and particularly more like in the brain. And um, he has one in Bucharest, I think one in Brazil, also a lab like is studying, but. The idea is to, to study a lot neglect. So, you know, as a baby, you need someone to kind of show you emotions and be attached to and, like, that communicates with you and, and, and gives you cognitive stimulation. So what happens to the kids that don't have that, right? And and then they look at things in terms of uh, neural development but also behavior at the end and, and temperament and all this stuff. And, and, of course, they see quite a lot of things. So if in the first years you don't have this it will have big influence in your temperament and the way you um, you see the world and, and how you attach to people and, and, and your, the emotions you have around them. So. Yeah, yeah. I read this really interesting book called Attached about the three different, you know, attachment, avoidant um, issues, or not right. issues, but states of, of being, yeah. you know. 
And I wonder at when when reading that, I'm like, how much of this is just coming from the first couple of years of your life? You know, no. For parents who they're together and they're happy, but one of them works a lot or travels for work a lot. Maybe they're an athlete or an right. actor or a scientist, and they're just gone a lot. Still a happy family, just not present all the time. Um, versus people around all the time. You know, it's like I remember when I was really really little. I didn't see my dad a lot in like the mornings. He was at work, mm -hmm. um, but I saw him in the evenings. And it took a long time for me to to associate my dad with like a person that existed in other states of time. <laughs> it took him yeah. until maybe probably like six or seven years old to be like, because I never saw him in the mornings. Right. It took until he was either off work a weekend, which he was never off work. He's one right. of those guys who just did not miss work. So it was really vacation a weekend or when he retired that I saw him in the morning. Obviously, when I got older, I could make sense of it. But as yeah. a little kid, I was just like, oh, dad's like the night guy, like the evening entity. And and mom is omnipresent. Mom is always there. Right. And dad is just night. And yeah, that's just yeah, how yeah. I felt, for, you know, three, four, five, six, seven, like the first fundamental years right. of memory. I don't ever remember seeing my dad in the morning, right. like ever. Yeah, I have a uh, funny stories about that, that... um so when I was about probably four or five, I kind of understood what work me meant. But for me, work was like I knew my dad was working, um, but it was more about for me, I saw him working in a particular place. So for me, work is like he's in that place. Um, and that was a place that he will only be sometimes, but most of the time he was working in a different place. But for me, that's, that's the only thing I could understand. So I would just... A lot of times leave the house without telling anyone <laughs> to go to see my dad at work. Oh, how old and were then you? I was like four or five. And then well, suddenly, where did he work? Uh, he like he worked like one hour by car from my house. But like he <laughs> sometimes will be in a place that was like maybe ten minutes walking from my house. So to me, it was like, oh, it's I don't know. Somehow I, <laughs> it was not that far, so I will just go out alone, being super young. And I did that maybe three, four times. Um, I don't know how I even managed to open the door of the house or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and then I remember because my parents were always telling me, like, you have to walk far away from the road. So I'll just, like, go out. And because I was alone, I was like, okay, I'm, I really n now need to follow the rules because now they are, my parents are not here. So no one is going to protect me. So I'm going to follow the rules. They tell me be far away from the road. So I'll just go to the wall <laughs> and be like completely like touching the wall all the yeah. time and be walking like side, you know, <laughs> on the side. I don't know how to say it in English, but like uh, side to the wall. Yeah, you're uh, back against the wall. Yeah, back against the wall. And then there will be like people outside being like, Who, who's this young child, child alone back against the wall. walking that way? And then they will ask like, where are you going? It's like, oh, to see my dad at work. And uh, so different times. Yeah. Different. Yeah. Now the police would be called. People would be. Yeah. Going nuts. <laughs> yeah. I remember it, being alone so much as a kid, like getting into so much trouble. When I was like five, four or five years old, I'd just go in the house mixing like all the chemicals, like products together uh, from under like, oh, wow. You know, in the garage, the basement, under the <laughs> sink. And then I would like pour it on like the grass and just watch it like kill it or put like an ant in it or a worm yeah. and just like see what happened or just accidentally spill it on the carpet and stain right. it. It's very interesting. I wonder like where imagination and like the lack of reality right. meet reality and like imagination fading. I mean, it tends to start really happening after like pre pre puberty, really you start to lose like a true imagination. Like now I can imagine stuff but it's based in like my adult human reality. Right. You know, I could think of like, okay, you know, I'm going, I can imagine what it's like to record a band on here again. It's not, it hasn't happened yet, but I know how I can imagine right. it. But at five years old, it would be like fantastical and like a wonderless it's a thought. dream. <laughs> yeah. And it, it always yeah. was. It's like, yeah, we're going to build this cabin. We're, we're going to be like army guys and we're going to like protect the cabin. Yeah. Again. Like, and you would do it, but it was like right. so fantastic. People take drugs as adults to have these. <laughs> That's <laughs> true. I guess what we have to do is take uh, yeah. mushrooms and LSD now. But yeah. <laughs> Which no, University but, of Chicago does a lot of interesting studies. Yeah. Like that. Uh, a in lot neuroscience is a big thing now. Uh, like uh, I might sign up for some of those just for fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just to have legal reasons to take no, it. No, psychedelics is a, it's a really hot topic right now. It so, is. It yeah. is. Which I'm, I'm glad because it's people, you don't have to do them if you don't want to. But 
to give people like felony charges for something like that, it, after you've done them, I'm not sure if you have, but after you've done them, it's kind of like, this is kind of ridiculous to yeah. throw someone in prison for taking mushrooms or having them or owning them. It's like, it might not be for you and that's okay, but it, you shouldn't get in I that mean, much not, trouble. Yeah. <laughs> it's not crazy. to go out in travel, the most you can do is maybe support them in case they don't do it well. I don't know. <laughs> like, yeah. Educate I mean, people the, on it. Yeah. You know? Kind of educate to, so people don't have really bad experiences. Is it yeah. more, uh, it's okay now for, for professors and people to talk about it at, at it, school for you? In my environment, uh, I rarely can see a moment in which I can talk about drugs. <laughs> because it, in it's children. Yeah, right, with you work right. with babies and children, so that's, you know. Obviously, but if yeah. you go into neuroscience, maybe people talk more. But I remember I was in Berkeley doing a visit stay, and there was a professor there that was talking about a uh, um, story about the, like another professor, I think from Harvard or something like this, that he just visited uh, Berkeley and he was giving a talk. And then they were talking about psychedelics and all this stuff. And then he was saying, like, yeah, there's, like, this illusion, um, like, picture or whatever that creates an illusion. And then you either see two faces or two calves or this kind of stuff. Um, and they were like, and I, you know, there's a thing that you cannot see both at the same time. But I thought that maybe with psychedelics you can do it because maybe it's different. And then I took psychedelics just to try it myself. <laughs> and then the professor was like, oh, what did you see? And he was like, I see, like, everything <laughs> Diffuse, like went away. <laughs> I didn't see anything. I didn't <laughs> see anything. Yeah. yeah, like just not what I was expecting at all. Uh, mm -hmm. None of none of the two things were appearing. So I don't know, but yeah. So some people talk about it, but in my environment, particular baby, um, right. children world, it's like what is like party, drugs, uh, alcohol. It's not. It's not no. like, the thing that people like to talk about. Yeah, I could see that. Obviously, that <laughs> yeah. kids around. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing, personally, maybe it's because I'm, I'm more mature and older now and I take it seriously, but especially mental health because it can be dangerous mixing all that stuff, especially with like alcohol and especially if you get into like harder drugs that aren't, that are more dangerous like cocaine and heroin and whatnot, methamphetamines, but it's it's not for everyone, but um, it's certainly not what... I thought it was. It's not as nefarious as I thought it was. After trying mushrooms right. many, many times and many different doses, I've had only good experiences. And even right. a bad experience was a good one because it made me wonder and think about what made it bad to begin with. It's usually simple stuff you're ignoring in life, certain anxieties, or maybe you hurt somebody and that came out during your trip. So it's right. like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to figure out why that happened. Like, I don't know. I've never had a bad experience with right. that. Yeah. yeah, I took psychedelics. I didn't, like, it's not something that <laughs> it's for me. I think that much. I took acid one time. Um, it started amazing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was super interesting, and I really kind of, you know, I'm happy to have it done because it was really interesting and to understand the mind also, like, in this way, like, you suddenly see life in a different way and you understand why a lot of artists, you know, when they do these really strange... <laughs> things the like these covers these videos like why would they do that and then you take us it's like oh now i understand <laughs> yeah yeah but uh, um but i had a really bad ending of it oh, um man. i kind of i was expecting it to finish kind of early and like easy you know suddenly oh, no. like oh it's out and and it would like it would take forever and my brain will be completely like <laughs> i don't know flat at some point um, so I started like getting a little anxious about it and yeah. so the end it was not that nice um, so I decided like okay I try it once I'm not going to try it again yeah, yeah. but you know I can see how people might like it and, and also if I have knew before that this will be the ending probably will have done it better so it's this thing about education also is important yeah. like how you do it with who how much right like absolutely in what, context, what do you expect from it absolutely um, that, that's the thing education no. about it is so important I I didn't do it too much later. I didn't try mushrooms until I was 28. Much, much later in life, I got so much stuff out of the way, um, felt fully developed and, and right. a full-grown adult. And then I had really good friends who have done it a lot, and they told me, like, set and setting, be careful, like, be in a comfortable place, be with people you know, make sure at least one person is sober while right. other people aren't. Um, um, make sure, you're, like, you're, you have water, like, have water around, be hydrated, you know, don't I know people mix it with stuff? They're like, don't mix it with like alcohol because right. once you take it, I don't know what goes on in the brain, but 
you can drink and smoke forever and feel nothing. It's very strange. Right. I don't know how that works, but so yeah, I had good guidance, a good good advice, and I think I followed that, and I still to this day always do it in a very safe. I'm not that kind of person that takes it and like goes out randomly and right. just like wings it or goes to a party. I would never do that because I'm more experienced now. If I was with friends in a controlled situation, going to a concert, I'd probably take a little bit, you know, yeah, yeah, because yeah. my my mind is right. uh, primed for it. I'm aware yeah. of what happens now. I would never do it at first. I would never. Right. S- someone's like, my first time, I want to go take it and go see, you know, Paul McCartney or something. I'd be like, maybe yeah. <laughs> stay home, do it someplace you're right. familiar and you know what things are. You're even aware of like what sounds your house makes because right. things get weird on those drugs and. If you're in a foreign place and you hear weird sounds, you might freak out. And it might just be the way your fridge and your washer and dryer work, you know? Right. It's that's it's that, that subtle. Yeah. That's why in these experiments at the lab in which people like to give to people LSD or a control thing that is nothing, and they, they try, for example, to measure the brain or something like this, I'm always like, I don't know if I, you know, doing LSD and then you have to go into machine, like fMRI machine that is yeah. noisy and you have to be there. <laughs> you cannot move and like they do a task or whatever like that's I don't know how they even approve these kind of things because yeah. it doesn't feel like the safe environment that you want for these situations. So, But how so, like uh, it's, it's either that or you have the, the doctor who's administrating it like or administering it rather come to your house or your place where you're comfortable right. and that's like then it's biased towards your feelings in that place. So it's like, I don't know yeah, what yeah. way no, to no, do I mean, it. If you want to study, you have to do it that way. But I always, <laughs> I'm always pretty impressed <laughs> about, wow, it's, you know, you have to decide to take it in that particular yeah. case, which is like a lab. It's not particularly nice. There's not much going on. Yeah, uh, that is funny. Uh, I never thought about that, especially yeah. an MRI machine. Um, I don't think I could do that. I don't, I don't think I could do an MRI machine because I have a bunch of metal in my face oh, and yeah, head. Oh, yeah, that's true. So they might kill yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't allow you, yeah. <laughs> they ask you always before. What would, and they how would, like, they, no. uh, what would they use on me then? Like how would they, if I needed to get something akin to an MRI because I maybe have something in my, I, I have an issue. Like, right. What would I they mean, use to see it? There's an um, electroencephalogram or like there's a magnetocephalogram magnetoencephalogram <laughs> which uh, and there are other techniques that don't require the same things and then you can do it with metal it's more fine mm. uh, but yeah I think for a lot of things I actually don't exactly know but I know that from some studies you have to ask before like do yeah. you have metal in your head because that's <laughs> not then you cannot do it yeah, yeah unfortunately so, I do yeah um, yeah so I don't know how, <laughs> how to do research on how to get. <laughs> but are, people uh, don't get the fMRIs or MRIs that often, I think, in general. Like, except for, you know, like in your case, you got it a lot at the beginning yeah. for uh, for what happened to you. But Yeah, the, yeah my mom, uh, it was too, my mom noticed um, why she even brought me to the doctor. I was nine months old. So you know what a nine month old is like. And I was just like watching TV, but I kept... Tilting my head to the side and like down like this mm. to like align my eyes. Um, and she was like, you know, moms, they like know their babies better than anyone. Right. So she's like, that's different. Like he doesn't do that. Why is he doing that? Right. I kept doing it. So she brought me into this doctor and he was one of the only two. Um, he was a cosmetic, like a plastic surgeon slash mm-hmm. like neurosurgeon. Um, one of the only two in the world who can like do this kind of procedure. And luckily, he was here in Chicago. And yeah, and they were like, yeah, his soft spots closed up and his brain is going to start getting squished right. and not good. Right. So yeah, they did some magic. But um, yeah, I mean, yeah, that, was, that's really the power of observing behaviors. Yeah, exactly. Uh, like, like she was like, I knew something wasn't like, right. Oh, something is different. And then, you know, it just in these cases, you check just in case. And that in that case, it yeah. was really useful. And it's crazy to think. You know, a hundred years, a thousand years ago, how many babies died from things like this? Right. You're just like, I don't know. And it's where I think a lot of interesting stories and parables and legends come from when you can't explain things as, as a right. human being, as a species, you know? Just all of a sudden, I might have made it to two or three years old before. I either would have died or had some serious developmental issues or mental health issues or physical ailments. Like, it wouldn't have been good, you know? Right. But, um, yeah, it's kind of remarkable, and I don't know. It's I'm grateful for it. Like, 
it's funny. I've also had really bad experiences with medical and doctors, you know, like, mm. uh, I don't even need to go into, it, but not good <laughs> ones. And, yeah. but then I've had like the best, some that have saved my life and some that have almost taken my life. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. Have you yeah. had, have you had any, uh, crazy issues with? No, I, I, when I was born, I was, uh, when I was a kid, a, a lot of things were not exactly in the right place, but, <laughs> but it was nothing. It what was does that mean? Not exactly. I mean, in the sense that they had to like every day for a beat, I like had problems in my ears. They hurt a lot. So they had to do an mm. operation about that. And I also like at some point I had something with my, um, how it's called, uh, thyroid. No, the the Adam's apple? the things that allow you to tonsils, maybe vocal cords, vocal cords. Okay, <laughs> that's close. Um, it was they were weird. One was like uh, uh, longer than the other one. So at some point they were checking and they were like, maybe we can operate and change that. And then it was funny because the doctor at some point said like, we, we look. I think my mom asked to three doctors and then at some point because I, I talk with his voice like this <laughs> and then at some point the doctor said like ah, it's fine like it's like well I mean the only thing if he wants to be a singer that's the only problem but otherwise it's fine and then look here I am a singer being a singer <laughs> um, so so yeah so that's uh, the thing and then I was walking with um, my feet were looking to each other and they were mm. like completely like uh, yeah Weights now, not like looking in front. So I, for I think six months, I was sleeping in a bed with uh, some metal in my legs <laughs> that would not allow me to move oh my, my legs at all. Uh, for so, six months, you had a yeah, leg and bed? that's the. I mean, clearly it doesn't work. <laughs> but at some point, someone thought that if I will keep my legs in the same position and my like feet will be like looking at the right part, both yeah. like on. The, then it will kind of fix this tendency. I have to put it like more to in, inside. Um, so, so that's another thing I had. But at some point, also it fixed. So I had a lot of this small. But it fit, it corrected itself. Your legs. Well, I then I started going to a more like professional <laughs> <laughs> doctor <laughs> that was not doing these kind of procedures. And, yeah, it uh, sounds very very like medieval. Yeah, that's like, <laughs> super medieval, medieval. <laughs> and I would like cry every night because I was like, oh. I want to move, I want <laughs> to go to pee, and then my parents will have to come oh and my God. make bring that's me terrible. like yeah. And, and and I was not that young. I think I was four or five. So I you know it's a kid oh, that can so move around and that. suddenly yeah. at night I will be completely like. <laughs> fixed with this metal in my legs but so I'll leave it for its gum in that sense yeah yeah. Uh, like almost yeah. like you had polio and yeah. you had to put braces on like, exactly it's um people who haven't experienced medical things or things we have to like a guy who had to wear an eye patch for five years be- right. because of the surgery these eyes don't work together I don't have mm-hmm. fine death perception I don't know it's complicated but I had to wear an eye patch to this eye was stronger than this one to strengthen uh, that I one see. Which doesn't sound complicated at, at our age, but to right. get a five-year-old to like wear an eye patch all right. day, every day, um, it's hard. And then not only is it hard, but it's 1995 and there's no PC and no one's polite and kids make fun of you oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in a way that kids these days don't comprehend. Yeah. So then there's like that mental and emotional problem with it where you're just always, you're either picked on or people like, point you out like what's up with your like always asking yeah. you questions so I got really creative of making up stories and I'd have them touch the dents in my head and show my sky I got shot I fell off a cliff I made up everything right. I had fun a with hero. it <laughs> yeah and they were just like what are you like yeah, you yeah. know it was brutal sometimes but and I had to wear these special glasses that had bifocals like I was an 80 uh-huh. year old man and yeah, they, yeah, they yeah. wrapped them on my ears with the eye patch and a lot of tests going to the hospital a lot um very fascinating stuff. They tested my sens- my sensory all the time, like hearing, vision, touch. Right. Put me in these weird black rooms and shine lights, and it was really bizarre. A right. lot of people, like you, just looking at me through glass. Right, right. <laughs> Did you, you know? enjoy it all these visits? Or were like, you yeah, were like I, super scared. No, I loved it. it. No, I'm, I'm a, luckily I'm a very adventurous, curious person. Mm-hmm. And I always have been. So, and I don't think I fully understood what was going on. I just was. I thought it was cool to like be probed and messed with and like right. doctors ask you questions to this day i love it when i go to the doctor my doctors and dentists always comment like no one's ever asked me that before because i'm just sitting there you know getting my teeth worked on and i'm listening to this ultrasonic blaster and i'm trying to figure out based on the resonant frequency of my mouth what pitch 
this thing's at, mm -hmm. you know, and I asked my dentist who I've known my whole life, like, do you know what Pittsus is at? It's, it almost feels it's like it's at, you know, uh, 32 to 64,000 hertz based on reversing the fundamental of like half <laughs> octaves. And he just like looks at me like in 40 years of being a dentist, like, no one's no ever one said this. Or I've never heard this before. He's like, maybe, I don't know. He's like, I don't know. It's ultrasonic. Yeah. It's above sound. I, I think you know? sound engineers, you are obsessed <laughs> with your things like... From in my band, Antonio is the bass player who's yeah. also a sound engineer. Yeah. He's all the time. He actually had a moment in which he had issues with that because he was so obsessed about finding the pitch to everything in her environment. Yeah. That actually became a clinical condition. Oh no. <laughs> I mean not it kind of like he had to work through to prevent the yeah. thought. Because yeah. otherwise it would like every sound like what's what's the pitch? And, and at the end you cannot function like this. Ah, uh, see, so, that's I, I know mean people that, that like that's that. yeah, that's too going too far, but it is. Uh, but it <laughs> it is a thing that, you know, like you hear something it's like, Oh, that's a frequency whatever, like sixty hertz. Uh, yeah. It never happened to me. Yeah. That's why I, I change my path like not being <laughs> into you sound do, engineering you want to do music for just <laughs> yeah for the exactly, sake of because i was it. not thinking about beach so i was like and then it's not it's not my thing that might but i luckily i dove so far into audio sound sound is on production music pr like editing composition the whole world of music sound and audio to the point where i got very philosophical about it so i i taught myself how to formally and and in a very philosophical way, detach from it. So mm -hmm. I don't have those issues. Like if I need to have that issue, and I don't really call it an issue. If I need to have that focus where I try to figure out what something is like at the dentist, I can. Or I could just sit there and let go and do just do the crossword puzzle on the ceiling right. and not even think about it. And I, right. I what maybe forced myself to train that is when I was in school learning about this stuff. One of the professors was like. Are you guys sure you want to learn about this stuff? Because you're never going to unlearn it and you're never going to be able to listen to music ever again. It starts to right. not be fun. And I didn't really like that negative like approach to it. And I was like, does it have to be that way? Or can I train myself to hop between these mindsets? Mm -hmm. So there's like, I can be a musician mindset. I can be an audio engineer mindset. I could be a sound designer, a sound artist, and I could be a philosophical sound artist. Or I could just be a music lover. Right. So if I go upstairs in my living room and hang out with some friends and we have a vinyl night drinking some wine, listening to records, I'm, I'm just a music lover. Right. I don't have to analyze and I don't analyze anything. But the second someone goes, what's going on here? And I go, I go into this lane switch. and <laughs> I nerd out so hard. Yeah. And they're like, I'm sorry. I asked. It's like, listen, I could be over here with you yeah. and just listen to music or I can go here or I can go there. We could start talking about timbre and the fundamentals of it and, uh, and, the envelope of sound and what creates it and why we have even a non harmonics. We can go that far, but I don't have to. I could just sit and talk about, like, yeah, I really love right. this song. The lyrics are beautiful. It's very poetic. And then go into poetry because I also write right. that. So I think to get away from being stuck in one train of thought is to learn almost all of the branches that kind of create it. And that way you can just kind of hop to them and, and right. be selective with where your heart and mind are. And it just took a lot of training. It took probably until my late 20s to get there. There was like a decade of learning how to do it. Um, but now I'm really good with it and it doesn't, doesn't yeah. bother me. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. It's nice to know that all of you, when you learn something, it might change the way you perceive things. But if you can, there are some things that are super nice to be, for example, as a music lover, it's really nice to sometimes enjoy just the music <laughs> without <laughs> analyzing it. So yeah. if you can come back to that, that's that's a great thing to to me, something that was slightly similar, but a little bit different. But um, I had uh, in in my engineering. Actually, we had really cool like subjects sometimes, and one of them was about more recording sound sounds of the environment and kind of paying attention to sounds in the environment and then create environments through sounds. So mm -hmm. we will just compose like a piece that it just kind of tries to transmit or describe an environment through the things you have recorded and then you put together. So after that class, I actually really liked that thing and I, I never pursued that much, but sometimes in a while I still do the thing in which I go out and suddenly all I think about is the sounds I'm hearing. And then it's interesting because usually they're like about eight, ten sounds maybe that you can hear some, in some situations, but you really pay attention to two or three of them, which is the yeah. chunk we were talking about before. Yeah. So it's really nice to put your mind in a way of like, oh, I'm going to try to control 
where I put the tension. And now yeah. I'm going to put the tension on something that's really far away or it's like a sound that is really constant. Yeah. Now I'm going to put... And, and I... I kind of found that to be a really nice meditation. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes yeah. you just go out for a walk for half an hour. You're just like paying attention to sounds in different ways and like trying to put attention in different ways. And and I think it's nice because you understand a little bit better the environment. You understand a little bit better also, you know, how how many sounds and input we get and how we select sometimes some things because they might be useful for our life. For example, if a car is coming, we just pay attention to, to not get hit by the car. Mm-hmm. But also it, it allows you to nothing about anything else because you have to put a lot of effort in switching between the sounds. So yeah. I don't know. I was like, maybe at some point, if I ever want to create a company, it should be about doing meditation. You know, and now I'm saying it out loud and because You're everyone is it. everyone is listening well, to this podcast a, in the <laughs> world and I'm, I'm done. But it's the biggest <laughs> podcast in the world. No. I have actually a lot to say about what you just said because I'm very well aware of that stuff. Um the first thing I want to say is what you're talking about is called the cocktail effect. Mm-hmm. And like right now we're talking, but there's that air purifier going on. Right. I heard people around the neighborhood, person upstairs, some water pipes. Um, I just heard that boom, like right. those little things. But I don't hear them while we're talking if I'm just focusing on what you're saying. Right. Um, and it's called the cocktail effect. It's, mm-hmm. it's so we can focus on what's, you know, important to us in the moment. Right. Not that the other things aren't happening, but this is the problem with cochlear implants for hearing is it can't do that anymore. You can't mm-hmm. discern the dynamics between sounds and where they're coming from and why and what should be important to your moment in your brain and what is not important. Right. Um, obviously, like if we're talking, we hear someone walk past the door and they pound on it. Our focus is going to go to that. We're going right. to skip all the, the air vent, the pipes, all that. But it's important to know that we can still hear that. So it's an interesting effect in a way that you can really focus in on your environment. When you walk around, you hear stuff, you have to like try to select what to listen to. But if you ever did field recording where you have like a mobile recording device yeah, yeah, yeah. and you put on over the ear headphones and you walk around, you kind of override the natural tendency to have this cocktail effect right. because now you can't pick and choose anything because a microphone can't lie. A microphone right. has no filter, ex- accepts everything in. So now you're forced to hear the world mm-hmm. around you. And it almost sounds it sounds very surreal, this sonic surrealism where right. things don't feel real because it's too intense and too, so much information. Right. So that's kind of if anybody listening, if you want to know what it's like to have a cochlear implant, cochlear implant for those that are going deaf or who are deaf, put on over the ear headphones, not earbuds, but over the ear headphones, and walk around with a mobile device like a zoom recorder, um, if you have that. And it is a very, especially if you turn it loud, it's a very strange experience. But um, now I want to go further. As as infants and as human beings, that do you think that's one of the first thing that develops? Because in a jungle in a cave, go back a long time when we're developing as humans, you can't see everything, you can't smell everything, and you can't touch everything. But you certainly can hear way further and better than any of those senses in those moments. And you can't shut off your hearing, but you can close your eyes. Your sense of smell gets used to a smell so that everything goes away. Uh, when you put on clothes and fabrics, you feel them at first, then touch goes away. Um, and then you can't taste anything unless you put it in your mouth. So the only, ha- only thing you have left is your hearing. So I would argue, or do you think that hearing is one of like the first senses that developed and it's the first thing that babies like really have a strong sense yeah. of? Yeah, so... I mean, vision is really important, but the the thing of special about hearing, and you can also say that with physical touch, but even when they're in the womb, they they're hearing things all the time in in weird ways because yeah. it's really filtered. Yeah, but they are hearing. So, so a lot of people actually, you know, have tested like used to test newborns, and at some point were like, wow, they can discriminate these things or they can do this. But then a lot of people start saying like, well, because they are hearing it. <laughs> yeah. They have been hearing it for like months now because yeah. they were in the womb hearing that. So in that sense, hearing is really, really salient even before they are they are born. Yeah. Um, so, so clearly it's one of the ones that they had already more training and exposure. And then in general senses, they develop really fast with babies. There's the first thing that develops and, and vision and hearing, it's clearly one of the most important ones um so yeah it's it's a really important 
sense. And yeah. I also one that, I don't know, people put a lot of attention on um, vision a lot of times because it's one that also we have a lot of input about vision, but I really like to put attention hearing Me in too. my in my life, as I was saying, just yeah. thinking about like, how can I switch between sounds? Or well, yeah, like these kind of things. Even hearing with um, communication, like one of the, I, I tell those people that are have a harder hearing, older folks. I was talking to my uncle about this actually this weekend. He agreed with me, and he's pretty much he's pretty deaf. He's like eighty percent deaf. It's mm-hmm. all from self induced. He was construction his whole life, carpenter. Power tools from 1970s onward, no protection. Protect your hearing. Um, I always have to do a PSA about protecting <laughs> hearing. Like when you're cold, you put on clothes. When you can't yeah, see, yeah. You, you wear glasses. When it's bright, you wear sunglasses, sunscreen. You do everything but protect your hearing. So yeah. protect your hearing, everyone. Anyway, I told him one of the most important reasons why I think hearing is the most important sense is communication mm-hmm. and language. And sure, there's sign language and other ways of doing it. But when you lose the ability to talk to your grandchild, your wife, your husband, your friends, your colleagues, because you can't hear anymore, you start to self-isolate. And he was telling me how like it could be very depressing because you start to not chime in on conversations because you can't right. – you could be sitting at a table with your friends and family and you're kind of like can't hear them. Right. So you feel awkward because you can't hear. You don't want to be that, the guy that goes, wait, what? Wait, can you, can you say that again? So you start to self-isolate while amongst people. So you're completely alone at a table from fr- of friends. That's actually a, a bright eyes lyric. I just realized. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, you're completely alone at a table of friends, and it's so isolating because you can't communicate. So communication, yeah. it's not just about what you can hear, music. It's about communicating, and right. language is one of the first things we do. It's kind of going full circle with how we develop, how infants develop. Is uh, in human and as humans get brighter and smarter, we use language. So, right. to lose the ability to communicate with anyone, um, at the same time not being able to hear the beauty of the world, animals, music, um, you know, sex, things like that, things that really connect us. It's right. it's very different because another test to prove my I'm I'm obsessed with sound, so how can I not watch a movie? with no image just listen to the song the dialogue your brain will fill in all the gaps the movie will still be fun obviously not as good but it'll still be enjoyable Mm -hmm. now watch that same movie no no um subtitles and unplug the sound or have no sound just watch these images you won't it'll be you won't evoke the same emotions you won't feel the same thing you won't feel as connected and you won't get as much out of it you might not make sense of most of it so Obviously, we need most, if not all, of our senses to be complete. Yeah. But something about our hearing has got this. It holds a special place in the human ex, um, experience, you know. Yeah. And it's yeah, as you were saying, it's something. It's so enjoyable to, I mean, listening to music. But for example, when, when I play, because at some point I stop caring that much about the technical part of playing the guitar. Particularly with my my old band I had in Barcelona, which we play a lot, there was this moment of obsession with pedals and sounds, and and it still happens to me. A lot of bands I like them because you know maybe they, I really like a guitar player because of the sound of the guitar or something like this. Uh, for example, talking about sh- Chicago band like Wilco, for me it's really the sound Nels they Klein. have is like yeah. something you enjoy so much. Yeah. Um, and and as a musician, you kind of get a little obsessed with uh, the problem is it's really expensive and you need a lot of time. <laughs> but you get really obsessed of like, wow, what if I try this pedal? Then I put the things together. Then I change this parameter. And like, I don't know. There are some sounds that are just enjoyable sometimes. So. Yeah. Very, there's a lot of texture. There's a lot of information going on there. And once you get really familiar with like effects pedals, like what you can do with a guitar at an amp alone is amazing, and then when you put in time-based modulations and choruses and multiple delays and delaying a delay and reversing that delay, right. you start to make these atmospheres, these ambient text textile things. Like you could feel, you almost can feel them become abrasive, and they take on a whole new shape, a whole new form. And it's kind of what's propelled the music industry is technology. The fact we can have these technologies because right. to make these sounds in the 1950s borderline impossible i mean a bunch of tape machines and massive computers and barely you can do it then you know so it is kind of fascinating but 
Yeah, I don't know. I'm very biased towards sound. People always say, like, oh, I would, I'd rather lose my hearing over seeing. You know, I'd rather be able to see. Mm. And I'm like, I don't know. I mean, stuff is beautiful to see it, but you can hear beauty too. You can yeah. hear in the timbre of someone's voice, you know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and based on your profession and like, <laughs> yeah, the I things you like, uh, so you cannot hear. Yeah, you cannot. But, uh, even like a podcast. Uh, think about this podcast right yeah, now. Yeah. Like, Someone can watch it with subtitles. I guess that could work if you can't hear, but there's something different about us talking, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's something also that um, I realized at some point that particularly like in partners and people I like and I'm attracted to, you know, with Tinder and all this stuff, Hinge, <laughs> and you just see the picture yeah. and you see like, uh, I mean, people can be really beautiful sometimes or whatever, but I kind of need to know I always was, had the idea of like, oh, I need to see them in real life or whatever. And then I kind of realized a little bit that the sound of the voice, it really matters a lot to me. Yeah. It really attracts me when I like a voice. Yes. Um, the voice is key when it comes to like a true like, you know, romantic partner, love interest, like the voice is a big thing. It is weird how like looks are one thing, but a voice is a whole nother thing. Yeah. Huh. That's it. I know I'm on one of those dating apps. I think it's Hinge. There is an audio function where people can like talk oh, and stuff. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. So there yeah, is yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that was not there when uh, when I was there. <laughs> when but I saw it the other day. I was like, we had a friend, and he was really frustrated. And uh, about, about dating apps, yeah, because was everyone like, gets tired, everyone gets frustrated yeah, at some so point. So <laughs> when partying, whatever, like okay, let us like, uh, and then I yeah, I saw that I was like, what? Yeah, <laughs> where's the thing that was not there the last time I was using it? So, um, yeah, it yeah, it's maybe not the same still, but it kind of goes into this idea of like you can hear the voice a little bit. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah, I mean, even even ba babies like. It seems like they they can understand their parents' voice in a, in a way that not a stranger. Like when I come into the room, my niece could care less. You know, it just wants to always go towards mom. Mostly right. mom. It's like seventy thirty. It's like seventy percent right. mom, thirty percent dad. No, it's like sixty percent mom, thirty five percent dad, five percent anybody else that could probably give them something they enjoy, right. like candy, food, drinks, or like an adventure. But other than that, like I'm, I mean nothing to these kids. Yeah. And is that a common thing that babies tend to lean towards more? Their if they have a mom and dad, they lean towards the mom more. You think that's? I, I, yeah, I, I think it's pretty common. But it's true that, you know, like I'm at this point, I have had a lot of babies in the lap, a lot of families. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I can do a lot of statistics, and of course, it's just like yeah, intuition. I, I never like wrote it down, but I will say that. 90% of the times the mother comes if they if one comes alone oh i see or 80% of the time if one comes alone it's the mother yeah um so it's hard to get a good so it yeah. i mean so they just spend more time with mom so so that's why probably they prefer mom and also there's this part of like like um, breastfeeding right like it's, it's like probably important huge. moment there's yeah. a lot a lot of like looking during that moment it's kind of like you're getting like you're eating and you're happy with that and and liking that plus you're seeing a person so I, I, yeah. I guess it creates a lot of associations but i think it's still in the society we live most of the times mom is spending more time uh, than that and and in other places i've seen it a little bit different for example my sister used to live in copenhagen mm -hmm. and i remember being pretty surprised i didn't know really how is it at home but at least outside in the street there's a lot of that's with their kids alone, oh. which I was like, oh, that's something you don't see that much. Usually yeah. here and in Barcelona too, when you go outside, if you see a parent with a kid, usually it's a mom. Hmm. More than I wonder that. why that is. Like, how is their society set up to where that can happen? You know? Yeah, probably it's like several years of talking about gender difference maybe they have more of a, uh, equal maternity paternity leave from work too that can and that, that and that's a really big part of it yes. yeah because they have a really long right like, don't they have yeah. like a year where both parents yeah yeah, yeah and that's yeah. huge because yeah yeah then, then you're you getting the time. equal time yeah. i mean every yeah every dad probably <laughs> wants to go out uh, yeah. with a kid and, and and go into a park the thing is yeah here what what do you have here it's like one week is that or two weeks if that, if maybe a couple of days off work and yeah. right back to it. Yeah. They, yeah. America's got some stuff backwards when it comes to that. 
when it comes to vacations and like <laughs> yeah when it comes uh, to taking vacations, a leave yeah. but because of being a parent yeah that's uh, we're obsessed with work uh, yeah a little bit <laughs> a little bit but so are you <laughs> yeah i mean it, it is yeah it is not, it's really nice working in the u.s i feel it's yeah like people work really well the teamwork and the collaboration i'm really excited about and i learned a lot um but there's this company you know, of sometimes on Sunday people might expect you to be responding to an email or doing something. I like, know. Well, it is My students nice are like to, that. I'm like, yeah. guys, it's the week. I mean, they're young. They don't understand that yet. They're just like, whatever. Ha- like every day is whatever happens when you're 20 years right. old, you know? You remember that. Yeah. It's just like you don't have a good sense of that stuff that you just like do whatever you want whenever you want. Right. But I've gotten really strict with like I'm going to really try not to like work work beyond – 6 or 7 p.m. every day. Right. Unless I absolutely have to. Sometimes it calls for it. And then, like, try not to do weekends. It's not that I don't believe in working weekends because I still do when I do events or a festival or travel or whatnot. It's just that for, like, I don't know, 10, 12 years, if if you really count, I started working at 16. I pretty much have worked my weekends up until the last, till the pandemic, until I was 31 years old. I worked weekends. So, like, I'm done with that. If I could have people come in like you guys did during the week, during the day, I'm going right. to recommend that. I'm tired of recording on Sunday afternoons. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm just, I did that for eight years. I recorded bands yeah. on Sundays. It's exhausting. Yeah. You don't have a weekend. You're not like, you can't function in society. Like, people yeah. my age are off nights and off weekends, you know? Right, right. No, I think, yeah, to put some limits to me is nice. And that's something that the University of Chicago. I think would improve slightly. And and there are a lot of conversations about it. But they could improve on that? Yeah, but I think there's really the expectation the students are just gonna work on weekends and study on weekends, which it's it's not I'm not against working on weekends and you know, some people because of their job will work on weekends, but then you they can like rest and all day. But to me it's more about putting some clear limits. And and that was really difficult here when I came because everyone had the expectation of you work as much as you can. It was really difficult to put limits. So then at some point I learned like, okay, I put some limits and then I can break them as much as I want. So sometimes I work on the weekend, but I'm really c- careful about respecting the limits for others also to yes. not set like kind of like the rule that everyone works on a Sunday. So if I work on a Sunday and I'm correcting like a, something about the student or something and I give like send them the reviews, I'm not going to send it on Sunday. I'm going to... Like, write the email and then, like... Um, save a draft, yeah. Not save the draft, but there's this option of um, schedule it for oh, the next yeah, day. Oh, sca- yeah, sure, sure. So I just schedule it for... So a lot of times I <laughs> send things Monday 8 a.m. People would just start <laughs> receiving emails from me. But it's kind of an idea of, well, um, some students at some point got super frustrated and, like, super, like, burned out about working a lot. And some of them were like, can I please send you it on Tuesday because I think I need one, like, Sunday to rest. Like, what? You should be resting most of Sundays. What do you mean? <laughs> um, so then I kind of changed my mind. I'm like, oh, that makes sense. People here don't sometimes don't put the limits that clear. So it, it's I, dangerous. I try, to, I try to do that a little bit. It's but. dangerous. Is that uh, mentality and culture, is, is it like that in Spain at all? No, that's really different. I think... Some people work a lot, like my dad, for example. He was here last weekend visiting, and and we're talking about it. He works a lot. Um, But it depends on the kind of work you have. But as a general mentality, it is more about you have to enjoy life. Life, yeah. So it is more that mentality, which comes with some bad things sometimes because (laughs) you might not be that effective in some things (laughs) or whatever. Uh, but, But yeah, and then, for example, in my university before... August was was silence. Like I would go like August will arrive and then everyone will leave. No one will send a single email and then you will come back and you will like keep working. Mm-hmm. Whereas here, for example, one thing that was difficult for me at the beginning was like there's not a single moment in summer that there's a rest in general of everyone. So you have to choose when you want to rest and also you don't have that many weeks. So so that part was really different. Yeah. Or or Sundays, for example, like Really rarely, my I don't know, someone in Barcelona will decide to meet on Sunday for a work meeting. But here it might happen sometimes. Yeah. So so that's that's pretty different. Yeah. Yeah. America's culture is, it has a lot of pros, but the work 
like work yourself, like pick yourself up by your bootstraps and like make it, which is like what we aspire to. It's what brings people to this country. Right. Why, why you might even be here, you know, it's yeah, yeah. a lot of reasons, but right. Makes it, yeah, we're really effective, really productive and really, you can make great things. If yeah. You work a lot. But, it's inspirational, but, but it comes at a cost, yeah. you know, it comes at a cost. That's, yeah, that's why like something like this, like this podcast, it's always, it's just, a, it's for fun. It's for hobby. I just like, right. I meet a lot of people doing what I do. And sometimes people pop up that seem to have interesting stories. So I just want to talk to people. It's right. like, I like to talk. I like to learn. It it takes up time. Some people see this as work. Some people do these types of things for careers. I don't make any money off it, so it's just for fun. Right. And anybody who listens, it's like they maybe they learn something too. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, it, it took me a long time. It took the pandemic shutting down my life to be like, I need to get my priority straight because right. <laughs> I was. I always say if there was an eighth day in the week, I would work it. You know, yeah. it was just too much, like all the time. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I'm the first person I'm, that's something I learned about myself. I thought in the past it was because of my environment in Barcelona or something. I just learned about myself that I need to be busy all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm trying to be a little less, but for example, today, you know, I was working, I came here directly, now I'm going to play soccer nice. at night. It's um, football. That's soccer. Uh, football. <laughs> <Okay. football. laughs> uh, Where are you playing at? <laughs> High Park. Uh, oh, cool. There's like intramurals. The University of Chicago has kind of a league. Oh, and that's cool. now it's the outdoor one, which is going to be great. That's that, yeah, a beautiful night. Yeah. Perfect night. Um, that's cool. What time so is the game? Nine? 9.30. 9 30. Well, we'll get you out but in a second. I, uh, it's already been two hours. Oh, wow. Yeah. Right? That went fast. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah, that will be fun for sure. But, uh, yeah, I always do so many things. Um, so. Yeah. But it's if it's a hobby, it's really fun. Soccer, hobby, yeah. music. Music for yeah. me, hobby. Yeah. For other people, their, their job. I always want to keep that a hobby. I've seen the inside of the music industry, and I'm like, I, hobby. It's yeah. too, it's it's sacred to me. It's what got me here to begin with, music, yeah. and I just want to keep it that way. And it, it comes at the cost if it's not a hobby. I think, mm -hmm. you know, I have a friend. I, I used to play in a music band that the singer got really famous. And... Uh, he he loves it. He loves his dream. Like he's just going like around in Spain. Like I feel like ten thousand people go to his concerts. That's he's amazing. going to around Latin America. But sometimes when I talk to him, he's like, "Well, I sometimes he misses these days in which we're just playing for one hundred people, you know, like or mm -hmm. fifty people." It's like, yeah, that was also really nice, and it was a different experience, and it was really pure somehow, and. Yeah, this what he feels have now is um, great and like it's super exciting and and I guess that I cannot even imagine playing in front of that many people. I yeah. probably cannot sleep for three days. But it's true that there's you know there are some things from just playing as a hobby that you you won't have if you make it your profession. Absolutely. But yeah. How many more years do you have left at in your fellowship or in in your uh, I have research. a year, I'm, I'm another year, and then I have to figure out whether to do it with my life, which has not been easy, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm working on it. Um, I want to keep in research for sure. The question is if I want to be in academia or side of academia doing some more, maybe more applied research, mm -hmm. um, or if I want to keep in academia but more like applied um, projects or like more similar to what I'm doing. Yeah. That is more like a bit more philosophical and like abstract and kind of more about understanding people kind of not yeah. on the mind that it has a clear application. Mm. Um, so I'm figuring it out, but I have a year more, uh, eight months left. <laughs> yeah. Eight months. Okay. Yeah. So around what next December? Yes. Cool. I'll have to make a move. Nice. Or maybe stay in the, uh, I mean, my supervisor is really nice. So she sometimes has, said to me like if you want to stay more like we you can stay so so that's nice that i university of chicago has a big endowment yeah they, they could afford a lot yeah right? and my department is really nice and supportive so in that sense is not not everyone is like this but in that sense they are super nice that that's awesome if they have money and you have not figured out what to do and you want to stay like actually for you know for them sometimes it can be good because now I know a lot about the lab and how things work, and I'm more productive than ever. So, so anyway, we'll see. Maybe I stay more time. Yeah, 
That's cool. Uh, yeah. Well, I appreciate what you do. I I, I really wanted to talk to you because I had people like you in my life mm-hmm. and many other children do too. So thank you for what you're doing. It's it's a service to humanity. It helps out people. It's important. Um, a lot of jobs are important, but this type of research is very helpful. So thank you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I look forward to seeing you again, seeing your band play. I want to check out one of those June shows. That sounds cool. Especially maybe that sub T one sounds cool. Yeah, I think both will be nice. But yeah, the subterranean one, I think probably is going to be the biggest stadium uh, or like stage we have done. Okay. Um, so we'll see how it goes. That's cool. Well, thank you, Mark, for coming here. It's nice to talk to you and get to know you better. Yeah. Um, do you want to say where people can find maybe your music or anything you want to share to anybody listening? Yeah. Um, if people want to listen to Teal Trap, so the band, it's called Teal, like the color, T E A L. And then trap as a trap T R A P. We are in Instagram, I think only. Uh, Facebook and Instagram. Uh, we're not the best at social media. <laughs> and then you can also <laughs> listen our songs to Spotify. Uh, if by any chance you're interested by some of my previous bands, there's one that um, we had a couple of albums in Spotify. It's called Cybe. It's C Y B E E. Um, and then you can check that out. Also, it's in Catalan, so you might, if you never heard Catalan before, that's a good opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> hermoso, hermoso. <laughs> Muchas gracias, señor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mark. I appreciate All right. it. Take care. Thank Bye, you. everybody.